I've created this, this model, and it's, it comes from my, my scientific background, where we're, we actually study radicalization of cells, and, and cells you know, in the body do become radicalized. And what happens when cells become radicalized is they take on the medium that they're in. So if you have a group of cells in blue dye, when they become radicalized, they're still covered with that blue dye and they, they look like the blue dye. And if you look at just the radicalized cells, it's very easy to think, as a scientist, ah, it's the blue dye that made them radicalized, instead of realizing that all the other cells that are not radicalized, still in your Petri dish, are also covered by the blue dye. And that's exactly the case when we look at the data. The 7% who think that 9-11 is completely justified about 91% of them say religion is an important part of their daily life. Guess what? The other 93%, 93% of them say religion is an important part of their daily life. They're statistically identical. So I, I go back to the idea, religion is not absent. When people become politically radicalized, it will necessarily take on a religious motif because that is their dominant social currency. I must have hatred towards everything which is non-Islamic. Al-Muslim makhluq irtikafi ghayr aqil salabatuhu ta'alimahu aqlahu wa harrabat awatifuhu wa lithalik saqatat bihi ila mustawa makhluq duni Islam really is an Arab religion. People who build fortresses out of skulls. 
September 11, 2001 was a generational call to arms that we can no longer ignore. On tonight's show, a virtual who's who of fundamentalist terrorism has pledged support for next week's Islamic rally in London. Speakers include Sheikh Osama bin Laden, the multimillionaire terrorist financier linked to the murder of more than 30 American servicemen in the Middle East. The founding member of Hamas has sent a written message from his cell in Israel, and Omar Abdel Rahman, the blind sheikh who was convicted of planning the bombing of the World Trade Center, has sent a videoed message. Other video lectures have been sponsored by Hezbollah. What a lineup! The organizer of the rally, Sheikh Omar Bakri Mohammed, says he wants to see the Islamic flag flying over Downing Street. Tahtaqir al nas you know, if you have this contempt and look down on people, it's, it, there's no warmth. The Prophet Sallallahu he embraced, because of his largesse, his magnanimity, his ability to embrace everyone. And so, I mean, this idea of really helping people, of helping mm -hmm. humanity, of not looking down on them, not holding them in contempt. I mean, th this is at the essence of our teaching, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of the religious Muslims have lost this. And so, when, when they look at people who are astray, who aren't practicing outwardly like they should be, they, they need to look in a different mm -hmm. way. The first slogan of the terrorist in human history, in Islamic history, they said, we want enforcement of Islamic law. This was their slogan. We want enforcement of Islamic rule. We want the Amir of the, the Khalifa, the Amir of the Muslim Ummah. And we want to struggle against shirk and bid'ah. In il hukmu illa lillah. Sayyidina Ali said their slogans, the words are correct and their intentions are wrong. There is uh, a legitimate fear amongst very many marginal, vulnerable Muslim minorities in Europe now that there is a, a kind of traditional right-wing chauvinism on the march again that is no longer allowed to speak against racial communities but has found to its great joy that if it polemicizes fiercely and makes huge generalizations about Muslims it suddenly gets a third of the votes and we're seeing this in Scandinavian countries in Holland countries that until 10 years ago were bastions of liberalism suddenly voting for people who are calling for minaret bans for taxes on their hijab for religiously specific immigration tests and that is alarming not just to Saeed Awarsi but I think to most people who are committed to the traditional model of Europe as a as a community of equal communities as a species taken in our totality we've been slow to recognize the degree to which our religious beliefs present a real liability. Sam Harris is a well-known atheist and religious critic. You know, if you think that the world is going to end, uh, and you think this is a good thing, as in our own society, 44% of Americans claim to be certain or confident that Jesus is going to come back to earth and judge the living and the dead sometime in the next 50 years. In fact, Jesus is only going to come back on the basis of most interpretations of prophecy after our society completely unravels. So it's not an exaggeration to say that some significant percentage of Americans would see a silver lining to the most catastrophic events, you know, nuclear war on down. problem that Islamists are suffering from. When they polarize the world and say that the world is one of non-Muslims versus Muslims, Darul Islam or the land of war against Darul Harb in the land of uh, the land of war and the land of peace, that rhetoric is the same as, as neoconservative rhetoric. So what is the correct view? Are Al-Qaeda's operations consistent with the fundamental principles of Islam? Or do they represent a deviation from the religion itself? Let's hear Prophet of Islam talking about terrorism. Man kharaj ala ummati, yadrubu birraha wa fajirha, 
ولا يتحاشى مؤمنها ولا يحفظ الذي عهد عهده فلست منه في شيء وليس مني في شيء a Muslim automatically when you move to a new society you have and stay there for three days you have given these people automatic pledge of peace and security because they allowed you to live amongst themselves the highest punishment and the biggest punishment for any crime in Islam which is what is called Habdul Haraba is indiscriminate killing of innocent people if you do that you have absolutely nothing to do with Prophet Muhammad and he has absolutely nothing to do with you he's in paradise you're in hellfire They are poisoning the mind of youngsters. They want to hijack the voice of the Muslim. Are Muslim? Yes. But do you know the Jews? Yes. Do you like them? No, I don't like them. Why? Because they are... Programming on Arab television can condemn Jews as easily as it exalts suicide bombers. And he is a shame. يصل إلى قمة السعادة يعني آخر حدود النشوة When I saw this, all this coming, this stuff coming from these uh, teachings of the Wahhabi sect and Bin Laden was being uh, doctrined with it and he is teaching it wherever they go with his group so in 1999 I stood up and I uh, spoke oh that was the biggest storm Almost three years before 9-11 Kabani was at this State Department conference in Washington, where he was warning about Osama bin Laden and suicide bombers. There are 5,000 chemical suicide bomber suicide being trained by bin Laden in Afghanistan, that they are ready to move to any part of the world in order to uh, uh, explode themselves. They are living in caves. So what you are expecting? They know that one day might be they are going. They are going to say whatever they want to say, fight the West, fight America, fight this, fight that, criticize and complain. And they, they did the mistake from the beginning. That they brought the, the, the, the, the problem on the, all, all the Muslim Ummah. Uh, it, is, it is something that they didn't make a right decision that instead of fighting, let us sit and negotiate and debate. I don't think that would be have a problem at that time, but the way that they they did what they did, it turned out to be on all the Muslim disaster, and that's what we are all as Muslim we are facing. Uh, Bin Laden is uh, is a, a, a businessman. Ayman al Zawahiri is a doctor. They are not very well based as many of the scholars they say in the Middle East or in Saudi Arabia or in Egypt they are not based in Islamic studies very well. Fifteen minutes ago bodies started dropping from the top floors of the uh, tower closest to the highway about at least five or six and uh, it was it was absolutely terrible obviously they had two choices to be burned into in flames or to uh, leap and end it all. Yani son yılların son yüzyılın en büyük fitnesi oldu. Evet. Ve müthiş bir e, savaşma isteği meydana geldi evet. Hristiyanlarda. Buna karşı Müslümanlarda da bir savaşma isteği meydana geldi. Evet. Az kaldı Armagedon'u oluşturacaklardı. Dünyayı birbirine katacaklardı. Evet. İşte o yüzden bu olay çok önemlidir. Baştan sona CIA'nin organize ettiği bir olaydır. Evet. Evet hocam. Yani evangeliklerin, evet. Armageddon istekli olan kişilerin organize ettiği neyle ikna ettiler. Ya dediler şimdi siz bunu yaptınız, Müslümanlar yaptı, e biz de sizin ülkelerinizi işgal edeceğiz o zaman dediler. Evet. Afganistan'ı ve Irak'ı yerle bir ettiler. Evet hocam. Ve halen de devam ediyor orada ki zulüm. Yani birçok insan da çok makul gördü, ne var bunda ya falan diyorlar. Who are we? Who are we? Why 
did they bring us here? And what we want to say about the first question, we are Muslims. We are Muslims who believed in their religion in its broad meaning as both an ideology and practice. We believed in our religion both as an ideology and practice and hence we tried our best to establish this Islamic state and Islamic society. I started to wake up when I recognized that my extremism or my sense of uh, uh, false religiosity was at total odds first and foremost with my own parents and nine out of ten cases with extremists in these organizations they have an odd relationship with their parents you've got to ask yourself if you're a Muslim and you think you're serving God and his prophet then the prophet repeatedly said that paradise lies under the feet of your mother if you're at odds with your mother which m most extremists are then ask yourself which Islam is it you're following why is it that your Islam is at odds not only with your parents but with fellow Muslims then ask yourself why is it that if you're supposed to be on in, on God's path why is it that the most of God's creation are condemning you as extremists and there's something wrong with your belief Don't get deceived from their apparent religiosity because they will deceive the believers because of their appearance. They will appear most religious but they will narrow minded and they were, their interpretation would be very narrow and they will be very hardliners and extremist in matters of deen. You see un al fail their character would be against Islam, they would be cruel, they would be brutal, and they would be devious people. Worlds of Hadith are they. They would be mutashaddid, extremist, in the matters of deen. They won't be moderate, they won't be liberal, they would be mutashaddid. Mutashaddid means militant, tashaddud, and in deen they would be very extremist in deen. And so much so, he said to his companions, Yahkiru ahadukum salatuhu ma salatihim, masayamahu ma sayamahim. They would be practicing Muslims apparently. If you see their praying and their fasting and their religious practices, you will consider your religious practices inferior to those. They would be so strict in religious practice. They would be reciting Quran, they would be quoting Quran. But Holy Prophet said, Quran will never grow under their throat, down to their, from their throat. They were hypocrites. Do you believe you're a superior being? A Muslim will always be superior to a non-Muslim, absolutely. In the eyes of you God. are a better person than me. In terms of, in the eyes of God, that would certainly be the case, yes. Because Illegally in America. The reality is very difficult to swallow sometimes. What some call extremists are instead mainstream Muslim believers who are drawing from the well at the very heart of Islam. The word Islam is derived from the root word Islam, which means submission. Sorry, I, sorry, Anjan. Uh, First of all, your Arabic was wrong. The, the root for, word for Islam is not Islam, it's Salima. I assume you don't the, speak Arabic. Yeah, I don't know where you learned Islam from, Anjum. It's probably from Omar Bakr Muhammad. Omar once told me the Quran even said which direction he must break wind in. Which direction, I asked. In the direction of the non-believer. Can I just say that, uh, you know, the lady there is not the only one from the Council of Ex-Muslims. Majid Anwar is a well-known sellout and he's a non-Muslim, he's a Catholic. I would love to hear Moderates, moderate Muslims, for example, who instead of carefully and quietly getting on with their lives in an inoff inoffensive way, which of course most of them do, why don't they stand up and condemn fundamentalism? What, one possible reason is that in order to do so, they would have to disavow aspects of their own faith. So in a way, the fundamentalists are the true ones who are really following the faith. They're the ones who actually take it seriously. And our Prophet وسلم, said in a very important hadith, يحمل هذا العلم من كل قرن عدو له, that this knowledge will be carried in each generation by upright people. ينفون عنه تحريف الغالين. They'll repudiate the uh, misquotations of extremists. تحريف is يحرف الكلم عن مواضعي is is to take something out of context so the prophet said that rightly guided scholars will repudiate the misquotations of extremists 
وانتحانا مبطلين and plagiarisms of people that are trying to undermine the religion or attack the religion just fabrications people that fabricate with ta'wil al-jahilin and interpretations of zealots of ignorant people part of the Islam doctrine to lie and to deceive for God's sake definitely we will force Islamic law and order when we have power a terrorist, five star terrorist the effect will be 9-11 again this is the foreign policy of the Islamic State conquer the East and the West until Islam will dominate the whole world for God's sake, wake up the Jews will be eradicated the effect will be 9-11 again Mr. Walid so beautifully put the Islamic case on behalf of me I'm so happy with him my mother mated with a scorpion Terrorists conquered the East and the West. My Muslim brothers over there, I really, I appreciate what they're saying because that's true Islam and that's why I left Islam. Islam would dominate the whole world. He has a set goal and that is the Islamization of the world and the spread of Sharia law. Thank you very much for giving me time. Thank you so much and I don't think it could have been said any better and I'm so glad it came from you and not from me and I really wish that if all Muslims took this stance if all Muslims were this honest, I think that the West would be in a much better position to ultimately stop Islam from coming to the West. For God's sake! To take out the word Islamic out of it and insert Islamism. And that's not just derogatory, um, as some Western commentators have said, but it's actually how Islamists refer to themselves. So if you read their literature in the Arab world, they, they quite readily talk about Islamiyya or the, talking to themselves as Islamiyin or Islamiyun as opposed to being Muslimin or Muslimun or just Muslim. So they, they themselves draw this distinction. But I talk about it in a deeper sense that this is a new phenomenon going back to the 1950s post-colonial Middle East Im influenced by people like Maududi, Qutb, Nabhani and others who basically broke with traditional Islam going back 1400 years and they set up a confrontational ideology rejecting Muslim teachings as well as rejecting and confronting the West and trying to set up a political entity in the name of Islam. So they've in the, in the last sort of 60 years hijacked our faith and it's ti time for us to recognize that what they're promoting as Islam isn't actually Islam but Islamism, a political ideology by their own reckoning. And they say, I mean, it's their slogan, La Sharqiyya, La Gharbiyya, Islamiyya, Islamiyya, No East, No West, Islamism, Islamism. So it's something that they've put out and I've tried to challenge in that, I mean, wh why, why do you talk about Islamism? Why not Islam? Generally, the Sunni position is always to err on the side of caution. Sunnism, uh, as expressed by the Ghazali, Razi, the great theorists, will generally oppose any khuruj or coming out uh, against the, the authorities. Um, it's been accused by some radicals as being rather quietistic. Muslims have the duty of obedience to a state um, unless they're actually uh, prevented from performing the basic obligations. If they're punished for praying five times a day, they're not allowed to fast in Ramadan, then their obedience to the state lapses in that case. Um, there are plenty of places in the world where Islam is repressed in subtle ways. There aren't many places where one is actively prevented from praying. You can be discriminated against if you're in Tunisia, for instance, and you want to pray five times a day, you're unlikely to get a good job in the government. And there are plenty of places like that. That's not quite the same as the practice itself being outlawed in, in the country. Islam and radical Islam. The biography of Muhammad is filled with violence and criminal acts. If you hear someone claiming that he's a true Muslim and a true American at the same time, then you have been deceived.
Prophet said, Al Haqqu Ya'lu wa la yu'ala alayh. It's a tradition, Islamic tradition. That Haqq always is on the top. Let us go back to ourselves. Before looking outwardly, let us look inwardly. If we are on Haqq to each other, between each of all the Muslim brothers and sisters around the world, and the Muslim countries that they con consider themselves Muslim countries around the world, especially the Arab countries, are they on hack? If they are on hack, no one can bring them down. But means there is something wrong within the Muslim community itself. If we can fix that problem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support us. Allah will not change what is persisting on people until these people change what they are doing. So if we are doing good, you think Allah will leave us? That is a punishment and it is a reminder that all, all Muslim Ummah, go back to your tradition, go back to your love of Prophet, go back to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who told us that 9-11 was completely justified, their justifications are purely political in nature. Not a single one of the respondents cited a verse from the Quran, for example, to explain their position on 9-11 being justified. In contrast, those who said it was not justified, that it was wrong, they were citing the Quran. They were uh, explaining their moral objection to terrorism many times uh, as a moral objection rooted in faith. It isn't so much theology that motivates a sympathy for terrorism, but a distorted political ideology. Dramatic pictures of the moment just before one of two suicide blasts rocked the shrine. You can see one man run past the camera chased by a security guard. The blast follows shortly and panic ensues. I heard a very loud sound of a blast. I was sitting down at the time, and the people who were sitting around me, most of them were killed. Around 20 people were busy in prayer at the time, and none of those around me survived. This was the busiest night of the week at the shrine which houses the remains of a Sufi saint. It's very dangerous. You basically allow commentators a, a, a space to legitimate views that are completely irrational, that are bigoted. This is, this is okay. Their viewpoint is entirely, it's a side. And it's good to have this side. Well, but this is the whole problem of what's been going on. And then, of course, the defense always becomes freedom of speech. When freedom of speech is your first, your last, and your only defense, you don't really have a defense, okay? Um, and this is, this is a fundamental fact. There's something far deeper that's going on here that basically people are refusing to acknowledge. And this is basically the, the, the, the environment has been poisoned by this. We have basically legitimated a lot of these completely irrational views um, that are not really based in any sort of fact whatsoever with no context, no understanding of other variables, other things that are in play and it's become accepted and you see the backlash uh, you see Islamophobia as a campaign uh, a smart campaign strategy and you can have a viewpoint out there and that's okay but if there's something so clearly irrational as bigoted you know uh, statements that have no actual factual basis, which these do, um, you need to call them out as that. Who's going to benefit from the spread of Islamic law? Well, I suppose if a man is just dying to have sex with, with a little girl or wants to have four wives or wants to beat his wives into submission or wants to capture some women and rape them, Sharia can definitely help him accomplish his goals. Uh, if someone wants to oppress people and kill people and torture people and rob people and enslave people and chop off people's fingers and hands and feet and heads, uh, Sharia can most certainly help. Uh, but these aren't the people we want to help in the West. These are people we want to put in jail. Come over here a second. Oh, I, heard, I heard what you were saying. How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. Boy, if life were only like this. The close relationship with the Jews has always been understood by biblical scholars and until recent years. This was assumed to be true. It was only with the advent of German revisionists like Wellhausen and Buchler and others who, that this began to change. They introduced ideas that Islam had something to do with worshipping the moon, rocks, or some asteroid that fell. Devout Jews know that this is not true. 
It's a fact of Jewish law. Muslims, they worship the same God that we do. I know from having friends who've gone overseas like you, when you get out of America, you, and if you give other people another, uh, give them a hearing, you can see how they might see us as oh, aggressive or warmongers Absolutely. and all of that. But I, I say, yeah. I know you know that, but I'm saying that because what I just said here, I, a lot of people in quote our camp would strongly disagree with, but they do right. have some valid points. Um, but I don't know what to do about it. People need to understand, it's not an ideology as an opposition of another ideology or difference of opinions. It's a very profitable business. You have sold your life to Islam and now if you change your mind, you're dead. <laughs> you turned engine, didn't you? Islam is a religion of fear shrouded with darkness, moving with the power of fear to conquer the world. Christians are commanded to preach the gospel, which we cannot do under Sharia, nor can we build uh, new churches, repair old churches, or even wear crosses. <laughs> uh, Christians are second-class citizens under Sharia. We have to uh, give up our seats when Muslims enter the room. We have to let Muslims use our places of worship as hotels, and we have to pay a tax to Muslims in order to avoid being butchered. Under Sharia law, you, you're, wanting, you're wanting to kill people. You want to kill people just because they don't believe the Quran. Al-Islam قال لهم أن تقتلوا أو تقتلوا وها هم يقتلون ويقتلون فأين الغضاضة هم يريدون الشهادة ويريدون أن يلتقوا بحورياتهم العزراء وكل ما هنالك إسرائيل تسارع لهم في طلبهم فأين الخلل في ذلك الأمر America was founded in part with the intention of seeing this false religion destroyed. The first biography of Muhammad was not even written until 150 years after his death. He may never even have existed. As a matter of fact, my next book is going to be called Did Muhammad Exist? And we should run from this life-destroying, anti-human belief system. It's about making people hate Islam creating something that is really abhorrent and people hate and make believe that actually Islam is this thing. These kind of books are not out there to bother you or just to you know, take you and convert you from Islam. They're out there to wash the average American. We're not the majority in this country. This is to wash the mind of the average American. So when the time is needed, they would be out there to execute us, hurt us, or you know, do whatever they want because guess what? In their mind, in their own perception, Islam is violence and terrorism. If Islam comes into a region, nobody can be forced to become a Muslim. Uh, and uh, non-Muslims must be treated with every respect and dignity as well. In fact, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, became a leader in Arabia after many years of struggle and resisting the enemy forces, eventually he granted immunity to those who were opposed to him, to his enemies, and he gave uh, uh, protections that were uh, unprecedented to uh, people who were Jews and Christians living in that area and uh, in the what is now referred to as the Constitution of Medina, drawn mm -hmm. up by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mm -hmm. there was a guarantee that uh, the Jews and Christians, uh, even though as minorities, they would uh, have access to the high offices of Muslims as well. In the Holy Quran abrogation, it's called an nasikh wa mansukh Surah 9 and Surah 5, these came and replaced everything. ينتقد الحريات في الغرب إنها لمهذلة أي ماض ذلك الذي يدافع عنه هل يدافع عن الغزو والغنائم ساح ما طاب له من النساء وقطع الرقاب وتقطيع الأيدي والأرجل من خلاف وتكفير الناس وشرب بول الإبل 
لأن فيه دواء لكل داء. Shit-based country. You know your country is stinks like ass. What you think about that? No. You it sucks. Then it suck. You smell like ass too. I'm. I'm. An. An. Idiot. An idiot. We. We. Beg. Beg. To. To. Fucking. Much. Fuck. Fuck. This. This. Country. Country. والحريات أقدس مقدسات الغرب ولا شيء يعلو عليها. فالرجل الغرب الذي يقرأ قول محمد جعل الله لي رزقي تحت حد سيفي لا يمكن أن يتخيل عمامة محمد على شكل حمامة سلام وليس على شكل قنبلة. I'm pessimistic about the Islamic world. I, I regard Islam as one of the great evils in the world. There are people in the Islamic world who simply say Islam is right. We are going to impose our will. Look at what Sharia actually teaches. All these inhuman punishments, like the stonings, uh, the uh, amputations for theft, the uh, the denial of the freedom of conscience, the death penalty for apostates, the denial of the freedom of speech, they are objectively inhumane. They are objectively evil. Universally accepted notions of human rights developed within the Judeo-Christian tradition as well as other traditions contradict these ideas and show them to be evil and show them to be not possibly from God. It creates a crippled society as we see all around the Islamic world. It's something that is detrimental to human beings. I do have to look at uh, you know my own government and I can't I can't be so naive to think that we as Americans we've never done anything wrong. She would ask on US television if she thought that the death of half a million Iraq children was a price worth paying. Albright replied, this is a very hard choice, but we think the price is worth it. I can see where a lot of the anger comes from on the other side. One has to remember that if the Islamic world is backward today, um, 500 years ago it was it was um, a flourishing civilization. All the great centers of science, of learning, of culture, of philosophy were to be found within the Islamic world, you see, and not in Europe. Over the last 500 years, we know that the Western world has began to gain ascendancy, began to gain power, and in the 18th century, 19th century, they took over the Islamic world and destroyed their civilization, destroyed their economy, destroyed their architecture. You know, if you wish to understand the kind of destruction that has taken place, you only have to look at it through the prism of what we did to back that when Americans invaded. They allowed all the great cultural institutions to be destroyed. The libraries, the museums, the hospitals. And a similar plunder had been going on for 200 years. Therefore what you see today is the debris of a great civilization. But within this debris there is some life. You know. there, is, there is a spirit. Uh, there are memories of, the, of past greatness. We have two sunnah. In fact, we have three sunnah. We have the sunnah of the Prophet in Mecca. Uh, one of the things that uh, Ibn Taymiyyah said, rahimahullah, is that there's nothing that's abrogated in Islam that if the same circumstances uh, in which it was applicable return, then it becomes applicable. In other words, there's no absolute abrogation. There's no verse in the Quran that's absolutely abrogated with the exception of about four verses in which there's no difference of opinion on. I mean, there's really only a handful of verses. All of the verses in the Quran, وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا يَقُولُونَ وَهَجُّرُهُمْ هَجَرًا جَمِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala لَسْتَ عَلِهِمْ بِمُسَيْطَرْ لَسْتَ عَلِهِمْ بِوَكِيلٍ I mean all these verses in the Quran in which the Prophet was told to be patient, those are all applicable because that's the Sunnah of Mecca. Allah diyor istesin hepinizi tek ümmet kılardım diyor. Ben ayrı ayrı yarattım sizi diyor. Ama bir Musevi de tabii kendisinin hak yolda olduğuna inanır. Yani yoksa Musevi olmaz zaten adam. Yani bir Hristiyan da kendisinin hak yolda olduğuna inanır. Üç din bir arada kardeşçe yaşamayı e, kabul etmeli. Yani bu bize Kur'an'ın emrettiği bir şeydir ve hadislerin de bize gösterdiği bir şeydir. of
very decent uh, a Muslim woman accepted Islam and then and she came to me and said this is what is being pushed to people uh, and pe people are told this is the prophet that now is your prophet this is the religion they now accept it the most abhorrent misinformation and lies about Prophet Muhammad and Islam in an unbelievable way all kind of illogical conclusions the most unreliable uh, resources and outright fabrications and lies and the problem is to the average American who does not know and it's our fault that the average American does not know you would think that this is must be true Islam the Quran and so on is bad it is bad there is a lot of violence in it and what's worse the peaceful verses are superseded by the violent verses the violent verses also sadly are more numerous in number then you've got the life of Muhammad again a bad man a very bad man it has to be said not a great role model if you look at it uh, it takes child brides, abuses a small girl, uh, multiple wives, uh, himself a warrior, himself a war criminal, himself beheads uh, uh, uh, Jews. Uh, this, I would have thought, would be a signal of not great peacefulness. He couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from the devil. According to Muslim sources, Muhammad was the victim of black magic. That's Sahih al-Bukhari. Muhammad supported idolatrous pagan practices like kissing the black stone and bowing down to the Kaaba, practices which are part of Islam today. Islam is an anti-Christ religion that intends through violence to conquer the world. وإنما سياسة ولكن طالما تتلون على أنفسكم تلك التعاليم المليئة بالحقد والضغينة والإرهاب العقيدة التي تقطع رقاب منتقديها مصيرها أن تتحول إلى إرهاب وطغيان وهذا هو حال الإسلام منذ أن بدأ وحتى تاريخ اليوم حكم على أتباعه بالسجن ومن تجاوز عدبة ذلك السجن لقي حتفه I came to the conclusion, I'm not a Christian, perhaps it's better for Muslims, especially those who are seeking a better life coming to America, to move away from Islam altogether. Not to just leave their home behind, but also their God behind. Forsake Allah and find a God who's all about love, like Jesus Christ. Brainwashing is the easiest factor for any religious boy. He may, be, he may belong to any religion. He may belong to Jewish religion. He may belong to Christian religion. He may belong to Hindu religion. He may belong to Islamic religion. We see brainwashed people working in India. And everywhere, those who fight against humanity and just commit the acts of, and burn out the mosques and the temples and things. Chalo bhai chalo namaz to lela ga chacha ji dukan band karo chalo bhai chalo cheti karo ve musibat chalo ji namaz to lela ga dukan band karo kam da dehaade yaar o button da waqt te maaf kari chacha ji sar sul di gal asul kida asul hai taya ji e allah da hukm hai ah theek hai 
ਕਿ ਤੂੰ ਕੱਲ ਦਾ ਬੱਚਾ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਦੱਸੇਗਾ ਕਿ ਅੱਲਾ ਨੇ ਕੀ ਕਿਹਾ ਔਰ ਕੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿਹਾ ਬਾਹਰੋਂ ਕਾਕਾ It's fascinating to me that fundamentalists are constantly talking about Israel as though they were the best friend of Israel. In fact, they want to convert Jews, and those Jews who don't convert are going to hell. So the people in Israel better be very careful about what kind of attention they give to these fundamentalists. I've written the books for the evangelicals. I have pastored an evangelical church. I am an evangelical. But I'm seeing so many of my fellow evangelicals who are being betrayed by leaders who are in a kind of fit of fundamentalism and the idea that my religion is the only true religion and my god is the only true god and you walk with that attitude to the temple mount it is designed to create a confrontation Glory, glory to Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Crusades came to Jerusalem, on their way to Jerusalem. Any Jewish person, child, man, woman, old, young, they killed them all. Without mercy, without cause, indiscriminate. We know that this has nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him. Yeah. They hijacked Christianity. Yeah. And then when they went to Jerusalem, the first thing is the appetizer. Gathered every Jew in the city. Put them all in one synagogue and burned the synagogue with worshippers alive inside. And then within six days, they killed 70,000 living souls. Every Muslim human being in the city of Jerusalem. Infant, child, recently born, old man, old woman, without mercy. As a matter of fact, in the Arabic language, there's a phrase called Adam al rukab blood was to the knee level that phrase was coined that week in Jerusalem as if the crusaders would just claim and back their properties that the Muslim took from them as if the Middle East was a Roman property represented Jesus as, a, as being of no threat to the Roman powers at all whereas in fact the subtext is that Jesus will come back and he will wipe out all of the powers in a violent slaughter of his enemies and he will rule by sitting on David's throne. He would realize the dream which the Jews never realized of having the kingdom of God here on earth. In fact the peace that, that Dave thinks is, is possible, the only peace Dave thinks is possible for Christians as he has written in his book uh, Countdown to the Second Coming is that in which it is envisioned that Jesus rules 
uh, after this violent slaughter. That <coughs> is not what the Bible teaches. I believe the Bible teaches that the uh, millennial reign of Christ is not going to bring perfection to this world. This is the final, the ultimate proof of the incorrigible evil of the human heart. But aren't you saying, that. Dave, and haven't you written in your books that that peace with Jesus reigning uh, on, on the throne of David only comes after this violent slaughter when Jesus returns after rapturing the true Christian believers and the Antichrist is let loose for a thousand years, then Jesus comes back and finally demolishes the entire system and takes it all over. No, no, on the contrary. I say the contrary. Isaiah 9, 7 uh, says, Of his kingdom and peace there will be no end. So it, it couldn't be the millennial reign because it, it, it ends. I think, Dave, uh, what you're avoiding is, isn't that peaceful reign of Jesus to be precipitated by Jesus entering the world and slaughtering his enemies? Well, uh, if you complain about that, uh, uh, you're complaining against God. Because the Bible, you know... Now, I'm not complaining uh, against uh, that, you know. but I'm saying that there is a parallel here which you have not observed. For, for, for Muslim fundamentalists who want to impose Islam on the world, to them the only peace is possible after Muslims conquer everything You're else right. and impose Islamic justice as they understand it. You're right. And the parallel yeah. is that you understand that the only peace that is possible and to which Christians can work for uh, is <coughs> that peace which will come after Jesus slaughters his enemies and, and sits on the throne of David. How do you know? Because I'm smart and I'm your friend. Oh, what you are thinking. <sighs> now, let me in. Let's talk about it. Let me in. You're my friend. Let me in. You're gonna die in there! All of you! You are gonna die! Sorry to see. You're still unconvinced. Christ will come back with a sword on his side, and he will come back as the ultimate judge of the world. We're gonna be behind him with, I believe, swords in our hands, and we're gonna we're gonna be his army. And this battle, the blood from this battle, will be as high as a horse's bridle. It's it's just something mankind has never witnessed before. Combine all world wars you want with all the other wars into one. Iwo Jima, think of Hiroshima. They don't want a peace process. They want the Muslims to be evicted by the Jews, the Jews to rebuild the Temple of Solomon, and then Christ to return and trump everybody. The scriptures say Israel will be forced into signing a seven-year peace treaty with their Arab neighbors and the false messiah we call the Antichrist will institute this peace treaty and he will move into the temple which he will have built and declare himself God and then the Jewish people will, will realize that he's not the promised messiah and then things then things get really bad as I think most Christians would, would understand to be the case and that will lead to Armageddon the American Christian right have what I would call an apocalyptic foreign policy. And if the people who are most making their voice heard in Capitol Hill or at the White House are people who think that any uh, peace plan is a, is a plot of the Antichrist, uh, that's going to get in the way of pursuing peace. Yerde bir de diyecekler İslam ülkelerinin Türkiye'yi, evet. İran'ı. Evet. 
Değil mi? Aylardan beri evangeliklerle görüşüyoruz. Evet. Amerikan radyolarında konuşuyorum. O inançlarını yıktık. Maşallah. Yani Müslümanların Deccal ordusu olmadığını onlara anlattık. Evet hocam. İnşallah. İnşallah. Ve bakın hepsinin nasıl karar olduğunu da görüyorsunuz. Yani bütün evangelikler İslam ülkelerini Deccal ordusu olarak görüyorlar. Ve nükleer bombalarla yerle bir edilmesinin dinin bir gereği olduğuna inanıyorlar. Evet hocam. geçenlerde bir evangelik diyor ki Türkiye diyor eğer bu aralar sertleşir, saldırganlaşırsa savaş açarsa ülkelere, komşulara kan dökmeye başlarsa bu çok iyi diyor. Yani Müslüman alemi o zaman deccal olduğu anlaşılır diyor. Barışı savunurlarsa diyor. Bakın şeytanlığa bakın yani. Biz de diyeceğiz ki ya adamlar bize bakın deccal diyecekler. Müslüman alemine deccal diyecekler. Ne yapalım? E savaşalım bari diyeceğiz. Savaşalım da bu töhmetten kurtulalım diyeceğiz. Yani ne duruyoruz? Hadi kavga edelim mantığıyla yaklaşıyorlar. İnşallah. Biz böyle bir oyuna gelmeyiz inşallah. Iqbal in his uh, Persian work, he says, the love of the Prophet is like blood in the veins of the Muslim. In the Middle Ages, there was always this terrible uh, image of his, he was projected as I don't know what, and when you read the, uh, the Chanson de Geste in French, early French and in uh, German, he is always a kind of monster, and uh, the idea uh, that he is a kind of deity or that he is someone who is worshipped and many more stories they have been going around in Europe for many many centuries and then comes the, the in the 19th century when tried uh, to come to a slightly more unbiased uh, image although there are many uh, books like that of Sprenger who thought that he was uh, a kind of epileptic and things like that there are very few stories from that time and also from the beginning of our century that really depict him the way he should be depicted. This question of the sexuality of the prophet that has bothered the western world from the very beginning because when Islam became known it was in the west the monastic ideals were, were very strong and for a good clergyman, it was impossible that a religious person should have any interest in, in female beauty or in, in women at all. And that is why this aspect has been highlighted through the centuries and uh, is being highlighted today uh, still very strongly. And when it comes to the question of the prophet, it's, uh, I think it's no problem uh, to accept, of course he was a prophet, uh, but uh, Again, it is probably the use of the word prophet, which in Christianity is restricted more or less to the prophet of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And it was difficult to accept that there should be another prophet, although it's absolutely logical in the history of religion. Religions developed, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's just a very uh, narrow-minded view.
They're here to protest the British soldiers returning from Afghanistan. They found themselves coming home to yet another battlefield. There's a counter demonstration. It's the English Defence League. I can't decide which protest group is worse. I actually find that the right on both non-Muslim side and in the Muslim side, which I term Islamists, both of them are peddling the same narrative of the clash of civilizations, the neoconservatives as well as the Islamists, and I believe both need to be challenged. كان ورئيسهم والبريطانيين ومن والاهم والصهاينة ربيبة ومصنع الكيان الله أكبر لو أن الله لنا يا أمة محمد سيقول حتى الحجر يا مسلم هذا يهودي خلفي تعال وقع ونحن نقطعها والله لا نقطعها أيها اليهود الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الجهاد في سبيل الله الجهاد في سبيل الله Both the Quran and the Bible prophesize an apocalyptic battle that will precede the return of Jesus, who will come as part of God's judgment on the world. According to Christian fundamentalists, the true practicing or saved Christians will be taken up to heaven in an event called the rapture. Satan then launches a wildly destructive Armageddon that envelops the earth. It is only after that apocalyptic event that Christ reappears in his second coming to defeat Satan and establish a new kingdom of God. This is known as the end times. Muslim fundamentalists also believe in a final battle between good and evil. In their version, Jesus is accompanied by a Muslim figure called the Mahdi, who builds an army to help Jesus fight Satan. When Satan is defeated, Jesus tells his followers that Islam is the true religion of God and commands them to convert. Then Allah sends a wind that sweeps all Muslims up to heaven, leaving the non-believers behind. What, what happened to Prophet وسلم, at the beginning of the message when he was tortured with his companion where he sent his companion is not to Abyssinia yes he sent them why he sent them there who was there Christians a Christian king so he filed asylum like today we file asylum in, in, in, in Europe or in America or in the countries that they are they are free, free to freedom and free, free of spe freedom of speech the people are, are filing asylum. 
So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi sent them there because he saw in the heart of the Abyssinian king there is mercy, there is asylum, and he sent them there. And if you look in, in, in geography, you see the Abyssinia is on the west. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not, did not send them east, was able to send them east, but he did not. He sent them now west. This is also a prediction for Prophet ﷺ that in the future Muslims are going to go to the west to, t to, find, to find asylum there and to take freedom there. And that's why you are in this country. And that's why people are in That in, is in a very Europe. interesting observation. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the Prophet ﷺ uh, vision in the future. He sent them to Africa. Africa is the west of uh, Mecca. So he sent them there. He said, go. There you will find the uh, asylum. It's a Christian country. So when they went there, what happened? When they went, they went there, Allah, uh, that king gave them uh, everything they want and sponsored them and sent gifts to Prophet ﷺ. And he said, there is no difference between us and you. Prophet did not send them east, did not send them to Persia. Did not send them to, to, to, to, to, to, to the country that are on the other side because he knows that asylum going to be in the West. You don't find asylum in China. You don't find asylum in Afghanistan. You don't find asylum in, in Pakistan. You don't find asylum in Central Asia. All these are East. Isn't that? Only he sent them West. Means the West in the future means you can live with the West. Islam can live with the West. Something called taqiyya. Yeah. Taqiyya has what nothing is. to do with Islam. Nothing to do with Islam. It's some. There were some factions of Islam that totally deviated from the message. Even their ideology sometimes came into blasphemy and kufr, and they were outlawed by Muslims. So they came up with this thing, very small minority and historically insignificant, that they started with this thing. You know what? Do not show your ideology of blasphemy to the average Muslim, so you are not, you know, uh, uh, prosecuted and you know chased out of, uh, of the city. So the bashers of Islam makes that taqiyya, which is a criminal behavior and a deceptive behavior, as if it is the normal behavior of the 1.6 billion Muslims. What have the Muslims done with that deception? Show me. We have 1400 years of history. They were always the most truthful, the most honest, when Islam was applicable, and that taqiyya thing is such a small minority in some of the factions of the Shiite Muslims, not even Shiite Muslims themselves. And it's a man-made thing, and it's not in the correct hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the Quran. How dare you say that this is Islam? When people look at Muslims and nowadays and say, they're innocent, they're good, they're my doctors, they're my good friends, they're very good people. He has an excuse. No, it's mandated in the religion to deceive you. Individuals who embrace Islam largely do so because uh, they find Islam to be attractive as a faith. And this is happening even today in places like Canada and, and the United States of America, where obviously Islam is not being forced on anyone. It sometimes even seems disadvantageous personally to be a Muslim who wants to be a Muslim when Muslims are being looked down upon and, um, and accused and, and uh, suspected. Mm -hmm. uh, but people are embracing the faith because they're finding it logical and reasonable. And when they compare it with other faiths, they ask, why not be a Muslim? One of the uh, uh, most well-known Orientalists, Thomas Carlyle, he said if Islam was intolerant to minorities and other religions and uh, Judaism, <coughs> excuse me, and Christianity, how is it that Eastern churches that were separated from the rest of the Christendom at the time, they were considered heretics by Rome, by the Vatican, by the Catholic Church, and they were not supported by any stretch of the imagination. How come these churches are still standing nowadays? How come there's millions of Arab Christians and you know, uh, Asian and Christians living in Muslim countries today by the millions? Who supported them other than the tolerance of the ruling system of Islam throughout all these centuries. Vous connaissez le Coran Et tu trouveras certes qu'il y a parmi ceux qui sont disposés à aimer les croyants ceux qui disent nous sommes des chrétiens et qu'il y a parmi eux des prêtres et des moines. Voilà pourquoi nous sommes proches de nos voisins. To get testimonies from Christians in Eastern Europe thanking God for the rule of Muslims when the Ottoman Empire came and occupied because now they can have tolerance and religious freedom because the Muslims would not, you know, 
force you to convert to their religion, would take the due taxes as much as the Muslim is, has to pay his due taxes, and you have religious freedom. The Patriarch of Antaki in Turkey, thanking God for the Turks, meaning the Muslims, for their leniency because now they can breathe some religious freedom from the oppression of other Christian worlds that ruled them before. Compulsion is worthless. What is it worth? Nothing. There is no compulsion in religion. But the insinuation is that the Muslims were doing compulsion. In, in Egypt, the Muslims have been the overlord of that country for 1,400 years. For a few years, the French came. For a few years, the British came. But overall, for 1,400 years, the Muslim has been ruling that land. And yet, and yet, today, you can boast there are 10 million Coptic Christians in Egypt. If there was compulsion of any kind, there would not have been a single Christian left in the country. The Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. We were kicked out. But if they had used any type of force, even economic force, for 800 years, there would not have been a single Christian left in the country. And we have the case of Indonesia, where uh, Indonesia became uh, the largest uh, Muslim nation, the, the nation with the largest Muslim population. And it is very clear that no Muslim army advanced into Indonesia, but mm -hmm. in fact, uh, Muslim traders went there. And uh, people were impressed uh, with the behavior and characters uh, of, the, of the, uh, the character and behavior of the Muslim traders. And that made, him, made them uh, decide that Islam is the right religion for them. They embraced Islam and Indonesia became a Muslim country. We Muslims, we rule India for a thousand years. But after a thousand years of Muslim rule, eventually when partition takes place, the Muslim gets one quarter, the Hindu gets three quarter. We didn't use any compulsion. Muslims see the fact that the Prophet had to fight wars as an advantage in that there is an example of how one conducts a just war. We as Muslims, because the Prophet had to fight wars, have very strict rules about how to conduct a war. You can't chop down trees, you can't kill animals, you can't poison wells, you can't target civilians. These are inherent in our tradition because the prophet fought wars and therefore was able to explain how a war should be justly fought. I think we should distinguish between two things here. One is the spread of the Islamic Empire and two uh, the spread of Islam as a faith. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, to a certain extent one can say okay the Islamic Empire expanded the way that empires normally did expand which uh, was in the past by the use of might. Uh, the lines of countries eventually came to be drawn after battles were, were fought and mm -hmm. where the two sides came to a kind of a stalemate, that's where the line gets drawn in between. And uh, we know that this side belongs to that army and this side belongs to the other army. Mm -hmm. Eventually we have countries being marked uh, on our globe in this particular way. So empires did expand in this particular way and uh, at the time when Islam started out as a very small group uh, of people, or Muslims were a very small group of people, they had to struggle for their own existence uh, against the many others who were struggling against them. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually they did uh, become a formidable group who were able to expand as, as well militarily. And, and so to that extent one can say, okay, the Muslim empire uh, expanded like other empires mm -hmm. did expand. Mm -hmm. But the other part of it is, uh, no, it's not right to say that Islam spread as a faith uh, by, by the sword. I mean, if you wanted to say that uh, the power of government caused the religion to spread, one might say that Christendom was helped by the fact that Constantine uh, became the, the uh, governor of, of Rome and uh, by adopting the Christian faith he made it official and through his, the power of Constantine Christianity spread. But mm. that's not how we would uh, look at Christianity as a faith. There is a certain uh, calling here, there is a, a, an attractiveness to the religion as a faith and uh, so too with uh, Islam there was an attractiveness uh, in the faith itself and people hmm. embraced it. İşte İslam'da şiddetin olduğunu vurguluyor. Halbuki İslam'da savunma savaşları vardır. Yani atak savaşı yoktur. Yani durduk yere bir fetih savaşı yoktur. Yani hani gidelim şu düşman ülkesini gidip alalım, şurayı alalım öyle bir şey yoktur. Adam saldırır can güvenliğin olarak kendini korursun. 
korumuştur. Peygamberimiz zamanında yapılan savaşların tamamı sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem savunma savaşıdır. Hendek adı üstünde hendek hendek kazıyorlar. Değil mi? Evet. Adamlar saldırmasın diye kazıyor. Yani hendek bir insan kendisine hendek kadar mı çevresin? <gülüyor> Amaç orada kendini korumak. E, o zamanki insanlar e, peygamberimiz karşısındaki olan insanlar cahil insanlar ve psikopat ve gözünü kan bürümüş e, eli kanlı katiller bunlar. Ve o zaman polis yok, hakim yok, savcı yok, adliye yok, bir şey yok. Adamdan aslı aslı kesti kestik. E ne yapsın peygamber sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem? Nur gibi Müslüman genç kızlar var, çocuklar var, anneler var, bacılar var. Adamlar geliyor biz öldüreceğiz diyorlar. Irzına, e, efendim, değil mi, haysiyetine, kişine yönelik saldırıda bulunacağız diyorlar. Ve nitekim de gelip vuruyor, öldürüyor. E ne yapsın? Savunacak tabii kendisini. Fazladır bu. E niye kendini savundu diyor. Yani bu sorun mu şu? Yani şimdi kendisine birisi saldırsa kendini savunmayacak mı? Değil mi? E o zaman değil mi? bir psikopatla bir karşılaştın bir bak bakayım ne yapıyor kendini. İllahi savunacaktır. Bundan makul ne olabilir? Yani her ülke, her insan kendine saldırılığında e, nefsi müdafaa vardır. The caliphate is not figured as a kind of generalissimo figure in a uniform who struts around and tells everybody how to pray. The caliph is somebody who precisely doesn't interfere in people's religious life. The caliph is somebody whose name is recited in the sermons and who is a symbolic symbol of Muslim unity. And that's what one is taught in the traditional creeds in traditional madrasas where I've studied myself. It's not this image of a kind of fascist Führer that, that is trying to rule the world. That's a travesty of the classical doctrine. I hope it's a you know if you can have you know some ice cream but uh, I can bring you ice cream if you wish Do you want ice cream? Yes, please. Okay, I can bring ice cream. Ice cream. Well, but, you know, uh... It not be difficult, my dear. The required principles of leadership and tradition. <laughs> what better to do with a woman in the frame? So we take the picture of this woman and we put graphic of Quran. My new empire! Your new empire? Don't make me kill you. Sayyid Qutub, you know, Allah forgive him, wasn't a Muslim scholar. He was a literary critic. He wasn't authorized by anybody to write tafsir. Uh, he, I mean, I, I, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's, it's, it's amazing that people think this this man was a scholar. He condemned Muslim scholars of the highest caliber. He, he unleashed a beast known as Islamism. He talked about politics and political parties as vanguard, uh, vanguard movements. He was influenced by Leninism. I mean, this all of this is historically documented. The vast majority of the ulama of Azhar have rejected Sayyid Qutb's teachings. Um, uh, people such as Bin Laden and others are inspired by his teachings. His no. teachings have led to... I mean, th the last point, Riz, if I may, is that the people who opposed people like Sayyid Qutb most have been people like Hudaybi, who was the Amir of uh, Ikhwan al-Muslimin, and his, uh, his book, you know, Dua La Qudat, and he, I mean, it's a long and detailed discussion, but Sayyid Qutb, with all respect, wasn't a Muslim scholar. Let's he wasn't authorized with a traditional Ijazah system to write what he wrote. People in the past used to, used to worship the idols which they used to make with their hands. Nowadays, people worship idols which are more intellectual, like democracy, liberalism, freedom, and so on. So these as well need to be destroyed. So the Prophet said very, stated very clearly that the, the, his, the tradition, the political tradition of his faith would dissipate very rapidly after 30 years. And I think Muslims tend to forget that, that, that this so-called Islamic State has not existed um, in the history of Islam. And, um, and I think that it's a political fantasy that a lot of Muslims hold.
We, we've created a culture, there's a culture now in which people can't see any other way out than this reactionary mode. And we've been spinning our wheels for far too long and the Muslims really need to think at a deeper level. You know, Einstein, and it's useful, the hikmah is wisdom. Wherever it is, wherever you find it, you should follow it. Einstein said the definition of madness is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. And the Muslims really, we have to ask ourselves about what we're doing, about our strategies, about uh, our attitudes and behaviors. After a period of being in those groups, I realized that the confrontational one worldview gave us very little in the way of solid results or answers to the world's problems, that they were spiritually remote from mainstream Muslims, that they were away from God. Ed Hussein, for instance. Well, Ed Hussein was never a member of his Bataharia. We need to have our facts very clear. So you're denying that? That's false. I attended cell structure meetings for two years. My direct instructor was Farid Qasim. It wasn't anybody ordinary, it was a deputy leader of Hizb Tahrir. A global ideology that offers black and white answers. And the answer offered by Islamist extremists from various groups was the answer is jihad, the answer is concentration, the answer is Muslim supremacist tendencies, and the answer is to take up arms against arms. The rhetoric and the mindset of jihad and supremacist tendencies isn't just talk. I felt personally responsible as a Muslim, you're compelled to speak the truth, even if it's against your own self. But also, as someone who was involved in extremist activities throughout the 1990s, I very quickly recognized the discourse, you're at war with my people, and talk about a them and us mentality and religion-based separatism and confronting the West and creating a global Islamist state. I recognized that because I was part of that very mindset myself. Yes, there is an element of risk, but if people like myself and others stay silent, I think extremists continue to grow in, in numbers and strength. And therefore, it's, it's, as I say, a responsibility to stand up and try to reclaim, to the best of our ability, our, our uh, religious tradition of 1400 years of spirituality, humanity, compassion and mercy. This is a specific ideology. We want to establish a worldwide Khilafah. I am 59 now. Throughout my life, Alhamdulillah, I have read throughout my life the Quran, hundreds of Quranic exegesis tafasir, hundreds. I am an author of 100 books of hadith. Just I have authored on hadith only 100 books, tafsir 100 books on law. So throughout my life, I have been a humble student. I have been reading whatever in my life. I have not gone through a single commandment of Quran and a single commandment of hadith of holy prophet where he has stated that the Muslim Ummah is bound to establish one Khalifa for the whole world. I have been listening this nonsense for the last 20 years. When I used to, the beginning, in the beginning when I used to come here, there were youngsters who used to shout Khilafah and Khilafah, I don't want to name anybody. And their leaders, they have been meeting with me. I'm repeating my sentence with authority. On the grace of Almighty Allah, I am a humble, I am a very, very humble student of Islam. That I have not gone through a single evidence of Quran and Sunnah. I know the Khilafah Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, I know everything. Everything is in my, I have written books on those. I have not gone through a single statement of Holy Prophet or Quran where Holy Prophet said that my Ummah is under an obligation to establish just one Khilafah for the whole world. And there can't be two Khalifas. They don't understand even the meaning of Khalifa. Just head of the state is known as Khalifa. Whether he is president in a presidential form or he is a prime minister in a parliamentary form. Whether this is a federal form of government, it is a unitary form of government, or it is a confederation form of government. Any government which practices according to the democratic principles of Islamic justice and social justice and political justice and human rights according to the teachings of Quran and Sunnah. You may say it parliamentary government in the olden days they used to say Khalifa or Khilafa. Khilafa is nothing else. All governments today in Arabic term they can say that we are Khilafa if they are working in the light of the, those true Islamic principles. And Islamic principles are the administrative justice judicial justice, social justice, political justice, economic justice, human rights, freedom and liberty, all these things are to be enforced. So this is, this is Islamic government. So there is no, but there will be one Khalifa and you have to fight all other governments. And particularly to say that the rulers and the governments of Muslim world, maybe it's Pakistan or some other, they are not practicing Islam. 
properly. They are not enforcing the laws of Islam. This is nonsense and ignorance, illiteracy. This is the problem with Islamists. They merge politics and religion in such a way that anyone who opposes a political stance of the Islamists suddenly means that he's at war against Islam. The principle of Khilafa must be one Khalifa, and that Khalifa is not me and you that will choose, is that that Khalifa has to be chosen by the whole Muslim Ummah. Show me one Khalifa is being accepted by the whole Muslim Ummah. There is no such thing. So every, every nation uh, with its own structure has its own leadership. So this leadership, this 60 over Muslim country, you think they can come together under one banner, under one leadership? Bring first what Prophet ﷺ has established. He has established all kind of relationship with, with, the, with the Sahaba and all kind of relationship with, with the countries that they were around him. Then he was able to uh, produce that kind of uh, Khilafah. Uh, now, where is that? You can find it. You want to tell me that the people in England or the people in America, or the people to go, go and take one state and make it an Islamic government, and then build on top of it? Where is the Khilafah? They, were together, they came together, they, they, they, they mixed. Let us take Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. Why they don't come together and make one Khalifa? To be the role model. If two countries between the Muslim Ummah cannot come and make one Khilafah, where you can be able to bring 60 countries to make Khilafah? During the colonial period, the West dominated completely over most of Asia and Africa, no doubt. Yeah. And this great major civilization, the Chinese, the Indian, Japanese, Islamic, the major civilization of these continents, all became dominated by the West. Mm -hmm. The con consequence of that was that in the Chinese and Japanese worlds, religion began to weaken. Okay. To the extent that Marxism took over uh, China and Japan after its defeat in the Second World War, it started to become like a Western nation. It did not try to assert itself as a Buddhist Shinto nation. Mm, mm, mm. And faith became very weak. Many people say that Japanese are the least religious people in the world. I don't believe that, but there's a great deal of lack of interest in religion in Japan. This did not happen in Hinduism and in Islam. That is, these two religions, the religions remained very strong. In Hinduism, which is confined only to India, because of Mahatma Gandhi and also because of the experience with the British, they developed at least outwardly a, uh, what is called world's biggest democracy, that they did not challenge Western ideas on the political level. But inwardly, of course, the casteism has continued. A lot of things are going on in India which are very different from what goes on in Europe. The Islamic world at first began to emulate the West like the rest of Asia, try to copy Western models. And as long as it was doing that, nobody talked about Islamic terrorists and violence and things like that. However, several events added to each other to cause the Muslims to try to preserve their own identity and not simply to copy the West. And they were? They were, first of all, the lack of success of modernist models between the two wars, the coming of Kamal Ataturk to Turkey, of modernism in Egypt, in Iran, and places like that, it was, it, they did not really fully succeed. The, much of the culture, many of the people were dissatisfied with what went on. Uh, the religion was threatened, and Islam continued to remain very strong in these countries in one form or another. Some countries more, some countries less, but strong in all these countries. Secondly, this lack of success led to, in fact, either political repression, governments which are mm -hmm, pro-Western, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. very repressive, mm -hmm. and defended by the West, and that still goes on in most Islamic sure. countries, Yes, and very little economic benefit in comparison. The haves and the have-nots, the uh, difference increased with coming of modernization in the Islamic world. It did not decrease, because were, these were based on models which did not accord with the culture of the people to a large extent. Then you had political events that took place one after another. The partition of Palestine, mm. the question of Kashmir, mm. the dispossession of Muslims in the then Soviet Union, which had gone on since the time of Lenin, but it got much worse with Stalin. 
The Algerian War of Independence caused the death of a million Algerians or thereabouts, a very, very cruel uh, fight to gain independence, and many, many other political elements, all of which had to do with the West and the Islamic world. The loss of the 1967 war by the Arabs, mm -hmm. which put an end to Arab nationalism as a serious ideology. Arab nationalism had tried to take the place of Islam among many Arabs, as Iranian and Turkish nationalism had tried to do in Iran and Turkey. And as a result of this, uh, people tried to revive Islam in Mawina. They were called political Islam arose again. So you have a turmoil within the Islamic world between those who wanted to go back to Islamic identity, the modernists who still held tremendous power and they still do a minority that rules over most of the Islamic world, and then the other side of the coin of modernism, which is fundamentalism. Mm. All of those called Islamic fundamentalism was not there before modernism came. Two. It's a reaction. Like in Christianity, these Christian fundamentalists. One of the biggest problems that we have is, is, the, is the concept of al-wara and uh, al-bara. The idea of, of um, th there's a certain segment of the Muslim community that teaches this idea that any allegiance, to, uh, you have to have allegiance and enmity, which means allegiance to Islam alone and enmity to anything other than Islam. And therefore to vote is an act of kufr. Uh, in a non-Muslim state, and, and we have people here on, on, that get public airspace um, to actually expound these ideas on a regular basis. Um, the, these ideas are sectarian and, and a, a very, very marginalized minority view uh, in, in Islamic history. Uh, allegiance to a, a state is not kufr by any means, and Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya argues that the, the classical formation of what was called Dar al-Harb, Dar al-Islam, and then Dar al-Ahad, or Muada'a, which is, th those were the three classical formations, the abode of war, the abode of peace, which was the Islamic world, and then the abode where you had uh, treaties with the people. He argues that there's, there's a new abode, which is what he calls the uh, Dar al-Maqam, or Dar al-Muwatana, which is the abode of citizenship, which is where Muslims are citizens. and they hate Islam and Muslims and they are democracy. Yeah, that's right. What's taking place inside that's Egypt right. and around the Muslim world, all the oppression, that is democracy. That's right. Democracy is where you in the West, you take our resources <laughs> and pull your fat bellies on our back and you oppress the masses. America and any other state against Islam and the Muslims, they can all go to hell and they cannot dictate upon us because we're the Muslims. We believe in Allah and our deen, our belief is superior. You know how many Muslims have been arrested? Over 1,000! No time for that! They're gonna kick your door down when you invest with your wife! They'll drag you from your own bed under any guise! And you all know how the Muslim would take our citizens here! Don't push me! gonna be victorious and we're gonna succeed and Islam's gonna conquer the world. Ian yeah. takes our blood!
There's a lot of religious Muslims that are really uh, have entered into a type of self-righteousness where because they don't see other people observing Islam to the same degree of their observance, they look down on them and hold them in contempt. Mm -hmm. That's called religious pride. It's mm -hmm. kibr. And kibr is one of the worst sins in Islam. And there is a hadith which says, you will not enter paradise if you have pride in your heart. And, and this is why the traditional Muslim view is always to look at people with the, the, the eye of compassion and mercy. Uh, in the Muwatta of Imam Malik, Isa alayhi salam is, mm -hmm. is said to have said, have mercy on those, on those who are in tribulation. He said, don't look at them as if you're lords. That's right over them you see mm -hmm. and and that opens the door for tawbah there is a hadith of a man who used to drink alcohol mm -hmm. and he was called abdullah and they, they used to call him al himar mm -hmm. he was like a, a jokester he, he liked to tell jokes and he, he used to make the prophet him, laugh and he was once being whipped for drinking and one of the companions cursed him and the prophet him, said don't curse him because I only know of him that he loves Allah and his messenger. Ibn Hajar al-Asqarani said that this is one of the most hopeful hadiths for the people of major wrong actions, mm -hmm. which means they can still be doing major wrong actions and have love of God and his messenger mm -hmm. in their heart. Sufaha, we have, we have people that are simply, they're safiyah, and I don't care how sincere they are, there's plenty of sincere people out there, uh, but we have people that are fools, they're foolish people. Uh, there's people that read things uh, uh, uh, and, and, and take them literally. You know, you have naql and you have aql. Uh, this is what the Shaykh's talking about. You have naql and you have aql. So, so unfortunately, we have some naql heads out there. You know, we have people that, that are not using their intellect when they read verses, when they read uh, these things. And, and, and don't think these people haven't been around for, since the beginning. Really, and they, they absolutely believe they're rightly guided. These people who are inside these organizations are also human beings. I changed and I believe that human beings have the potential to change if exposed to legitimate discourse, proper traditional Muslim scholarship. That changed my mind and I believe that if these extremists, who by definition don't recognize that they're extreme, but the Prophet Muhammad warned us about ghulu, which is a form of extremism in religion. So it's a recognized discourse going back to the Prophet's time that there is such a thing as extremism. When I was an extremist, when people said I was extreme, I never believed it. Those who are in those organizations now don't admit to being extreme, but by the Prophet Muhammad's own recognition and own advice, there is such a thing as extremism. And it's something that we've got to alert people to. And the good news is that there are now large numbers of Muslims beginning to question what it is, how is it that they're different from ordinary Muslims. religion has nothing to do with it would be ridiculous. There's a difference between an accessory and a root cause. Okay? Let me explain it this way. When we ask Muslims around the world if religion is an important part of their daily lives, the overwhelming majority say yes, religion is an important part of their daily life. So if religion is the dominant social medium of a society, what do we expect the language, the framing, and the symbolism of any movement to look like? Let's take ourselves 30 years back 
to the, to the world of the PLO when they were the premier terrorist group and not Al-Qaeda. They were speaking in the language of the then social, the dominant social medium, which was Arab nationalism. They were committing acts of terror, but their symbolism reflected the dominant social medium. As any and all movements, whether they're violent or peaceful, always do. The bold reinterpretation of the verses that talk about violence have already occurred. They occurred with the terrorists. The terrorists are reinterpreting these verses. The original classical interpretation is the one the moderates, if we're calling them that, are using to, to in fact respond. Are the terrorists using the authentic, orthodox interpretation of the verses that we now need to reinterpret because look what they're causing. Or in fact, are they the reformists? Are the terrorists in fact reinterpreting the verses to justify what they're doing? The evidence does not support that these verses in their classical orthodox interpretation are motivating the terrorists. The terrorists are in fact themselves reinterpreting those verses. So when moderates respond, of course they're not going to reinterpret the verses to tell them they're wrong. They're simply saying Islam is against this in its classical, in its classical traditional understanding. Sometimes fundamentalists or people who haven't come their home up or very often secular and then if it's against religion, we'll assume that Christianity is a single thing, Islam is a single thing, Judaism is a single thing, but often to the regret of religionists themselves, um, they are not. It's not actually a sort of regret to me, because uh, I regard the difference between a cult and a great world religion as essentially constituting not in, ter not in the number of its followers, but in fact in the fact that a cult tends to be monocultural. <coughs> and it poses a single creed on everyone. Whereas a major world religion is a kind of quarreling family where new ideas are constantly being entertained um, because the tradition is one of uh, debate and every possible permutation of interpretations of the scripture and tradition is still something that's living. But the mentalism doesn't have that, cults don't have that, but the monotheisms at their best have had that uh, internal discussion while retaining the evidence uh, general coherence. It might well be asked why that is not generally known to the Western media, and I'm not sure I have a clear answer, except to say that your average Western journalist, when he goes to a Muslim country, will be there for a fairly short time before he's sent off to Venezuela or China or somewhere. Generally, he won't learn the local language, generally his understanding of what's happening locally will be mediated to him by people he meets in the bar of the Ramada Hotel. Um, that's my experience of certainly how they gain information in, in, in places like Cairo. And generally their knowledge of what the religious hierarchy is saying, or even the existence of the religious hierarchy and indigenous mainstream Muslim scholars may not be on their screens. One of the great challenges for the Muslim world today is to explain to the outside world who speaks for Islam. We're in an age of religious illiteracy and Muslims can't be too angry about this. They complain about Islamophobia, but most people in the West don't know much about Christianity, let alone Islam. That recent poll that showed that only 55% of people in Britain can name one of the four Gospels indicates how abjectly ignorant the country has become. So to grumble about why don't Westerners know who is the Mufti of Egypt is a little bit um, beside the point, I think. Um, that's just how we are. Um, but nonetheless, that doesn't exculpate Muslims who have to explain, I think, much more articulately and clearly than they have done in the past exactly what the scholarly consensus is. The sunnah of ittihad, the sunnah of being oppressed is Mecca. Look how the Prophet ﷺ behaved. One of the reasons that I uh, stayed a Muslim was when I studied the seerah, the period of Mecca was an overwhelming period. Anybody that studies that has to come to that conclusion about our Prophet ﷺ. It's what made him great. And if you deny the Meccan period, you're denying something that's absolutely... There's more time in Mecca than there was in Medina. 13 out of 23 years. 
So if you deny the Meccan period and just say that that was all just strategies until he got into power and then at that point you stop forgiving and you stop uh, overlooking and you stop... I mean that's as if our Prophet ﷺ and, and, and, and, and may Allah... We seek refuge in Allah from misunderstanding who the Messenger of Allah is. Kana ahlam an nas The Prophet ﷺ was the most forbearing of people. One of the things Hudayf ibn al-Yaman said he said that in the end of time, يُخَيِّرُ الْمَرْءُ بَيْنَ الْعَجْزِ وَالْفُجُورِ And one of the Sahaba, one of the Tabi'een listening to this said, قَبَّحَ اللَّهَ الْعَجْزِ He said, قَبَّحَكَ اللَّهَ أَنْتَ He said, الْعَجْزُ خَيْرٌ مِنَ الْفُجُورِ That, that uh, there will be a time when people will be given a choice between powerlessness and between ext going to extremes. Fajara means to go beyond a limit. And, and one of the tabi'een heard him say that and he said, May Allah make ugly powerlessness. And he said, May Allah make you ugly. Powerlessness is better than going to outside of the boundaries. A militant kind of aggressive religiosity, sometimes called fundamentalism, has grown up in every single one of the major world traditions as a rebellion against this imbalanced world, a rebellion against humiliation, powerlessness. Religion has focused more and more on a narrow understanding of religious dogma. And there's a sense of rage expressed in religious terms. Every religion, as I understand them, has a history of intolerance, and every religion has principles for overcoming intolerance. walking by, he went, he went inside, he catch him, what, what, what are you doing here? Then he said, well, you can sell him the market. If Muslims cannot take them to the, to, and you know, and sell them in the, in the market, then you just kill him. It's okay. Salma Yaqub has negated her Islam by wanting to legislate in Parliament, whereas Muslims must believe Allah is the only legislator. Taj Hage is not a Muslim because he's 
rejected things known by necessity in Islam, like the hijab. And, uh, he rejects the sunnah, the actions of the Prophet. Nawaz is not a Muslim because he, he's negated his Islam by allying with non-Islamic regimes such as the British to silence Muslim voices and also by denying there was anything called the Sharia to be implemented within society. So the scholars of this era, he holds them to be unbelievers. And in reality, that this is what they mentioned. To be honest with you, to him everyone is a kafir except the one who agrees with him. Reminds me of a narration that has been mentioned by Imam Al-Lalakai in Sharh Rasul Al-Tiqad Sunnah. He said, this is the time of the third generation. He said two of the Khawarij, they were making tawaf of the house. One Khawarij, this is Imam Al-Lalakai, look, third century. He's one of the one Khawarij, he said to the other one, he said, look, look at these people. He said, all of them are kuffar, all of them, except for just you and me. He said, all of them? He said, all of them. All of mankind? He said, all of mankind are kuffar. Just you and me are left now. So the one that he's speaking to, he said, no, only you is left. I'm not with you anymore. And he left. He realized, this is madness. Majnoon. Ibn Taymiyyah is deviated. Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Ibn Abbas is deviated. Radiyallahu anhu. Imam al-Bukhari, chapter heading, kufr dun kufr. Bab kufr dun kufr. Whole chapter heading is Sahih al-Bukhari. Deviated. Imam Ahmed, Imam Malik. Ata, Qatada, Mujahid. So what's he saying? All of those are deviated except for him. Everyone's a kafir, murtad except for him. That's why it reminds me of that story of those two Kharijis that were going around the Kaaba. One thought, you know what, this khalas. No way I could sit with this. His bark, like a, like a hound that barks. Kilabu nar as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. Dogs of the hellfire. A misunderstanding I want to remove today. Some people, the Muslims, may think that the Kharijites were only historically a specific group who retaliated against the fourth Orthodox Caliphs of Islam, Sayyidina Ali, and who fought against them and they were killed. Only that particular terrorist group of that time was Khawarij, Kharijite. And Kharijite, two days to a terrorist or the people doing the terroristic activities afterwards, they are not Kharijites. This concept would be totally wrong against the traditions of Holy Prophet I, I have to establish this very significant point. My theme is, main theme of the fatwa is that the terrorists of today are the Kharijites. It is not an old subject. Holy Prophet said that this movement will continue till the day of judgment. The Kharijites. Holy Prophet said, they will come in my ummah in the history. At least more than 20 times they will emerge. And if we consider that the Kharijites were only those who fought against Sayyidina Ali, the fourth Orthodox Caliphs, 1400 years before, so that would be wrong according to the tradition of Holy Prophet. He said that was the first founding group of, of terrorists, Kharijites. And Holy Prophet said, they will keep on emerging coming up again and again in the whole all centuries and more they will emerge more than 20 times in the history and the last group of Kharijai terrorists will be the part of the army of Antichrist the Jal they would be the soldiers of Antichrist they will fought with him and they will again act commit the act of terrorism with the Jal also so they have to come till the Antichrist appears they are the same old evil. Allama ibn Taymiyyah is the one who declares that the people in our time, he says, not only those who appeared in the time of Sayyidina Ali, Orthodox Caliphs, were Khawarij terrorists. People of our time are also Khawarij terrorists. Allama ibn Taymiyyah, he says in his book Majmu'ul Fatawa, and his book An Nubuwat, he says, since they took up the arms, they take up the arms and fight against the governments and fight again for their ideologies to enforce the ideology and fight against mankind and they consider the killing of mankind halal lawful that's why the people of today this kind of people they are also khawarij and kharijai terrorist and say people ibn taymiyyah's words are innahum aksarun nasi la yarifunahum most of the people they don't identify recognize them
unless they take up the arms and start the act of killing and terrorism whenever they start the act of terrorism you should know this is a continuity of kharijite the classical authorities imam bukhari has put them in the bracket of kufr number 2 ibn jarir tabari has declared these kharijite terrorists with the kufr imam ghazali has the same verdict qazi abu bakr al arabi has the same verdict imam qazi Iyaz al-Maliki sahib al-Shifa gave the same verdict. Imam Qurtubi gave the same verdict. Allama ibn Taymiyyah gave the same verdict. Imam Taqiyuddin Subki gave the same verdict. Imam Shatibi, Ibn al-Bazzaz, Badruddin Aini, Imam Kustulani, Mulla Ali Kari, Abdul Haq Muhaddis Dehlavi, Abdul Aziz Muhaddis Dehlavi, Ibn Abidin al-Shami, Abdul Rahman Mubarak Puri. All these aimma give the same authority which I have quoted. worth noting the historical trajectory of Wahhabism um, I have lived in Saudi Arabia for over seven months I've seen what they've done to our Haramain al-Sharifain in Mecca and Medina the total destruction of Islamic heritage sites the breakdown of the Prophet Muhammad's birthplace the destruction of shrines that we had valued for over a thousand years the cl uh, clamping down of Sufi Muslims of Shia Muslims in Mecca and Medina there are blunders. The blunders have been made, but as Sheikh Hamza said, in fairness, large numbers of Saudi Wahhabi scholars have stood out and condemned suicide bombings. But at the same time, mistakes have been made, and in that spirit of fairness, we must sort of say to our fellow Muslims in Saudi Arabia that you've been responsible for creating a discourse of intolerance. Don't forget that when the Wahhabi movement started off in Najd in the 17th century, they started off by destroying uh, a, a, a a shrine of a companion of the Prophet as well as going out to Karbala and killing and Ta'if and then Medina and Mecca and killing thousands of people who were Ashraf uh, members of the Prophet's family as well as the ulama so it's, it's a movement that started off on the basis of violence and rejection of the mainstream and today there's been some moderation and that should be welcomed but as Shah Hamza said it's about being balanced and recognized that in recent years there has been some progress but okay. at the same time that I mean uh, where does Al-Qaeda come from I mean who which sort of theology does Bin Laden adhere to it's Wahhabism these movements, sort of radical attacks on civilians for, uh, on the basis of religious interpretations, pop up occasionally in Islamic history. The Ottomans had to deal with several of them. Um, the most serious case um, before the, the dawn, really, of the modern age and the accession of Muslim jurisdictions to the Westphalian model came in the early um, 19th century. Uh, when a group called the Wahhabis emerged from Central Arabia, the original heartland of, of, of the Kharijites. And they carried out large-scale atrocities against ordinary Muslims, um, killing Orthodox Muslim scholars who fell into their hands. So Ottoman jurists, such as Ibn Abidin, who was perhaps the most reputed um, jurist of the Ottoman Empire at the time, issued formal rulings condemning them for being guilty of, of Hiraba and validating the jihad against them by the armies of the, the Khalifa, the Caliph in Istanbul. That's really the last time when the classical model of Hiraba and a state reaction to it um, can, can be found in Islamic, in Islamic history. Even in the time of the Companions of the Prophet, there were movements called Kharijite movements. Kharijites, usually tribesmen of a particular literalist puritanical uh, orientation, usually from Central Arabia, were movements that refused to accept the slightest concession or worldliness on the part of rulers and would take up arms to depose rulers who they considered to be apostates. And these movements uh, were really um, a menace for the first century or so of Islamic history until eventually, like many sort of extreme movements, they fell apart as a result of infighting. Um, but the name of Kharijism still lives on and you find mainstream Muslim scholars now referring to movements like Al-Qaeda as Kharijite. Uh, the the term terminology still exists. The terrorist of today are Khawarij, they are Kharijites, Holy Prophet ﷺ mentioned in more than 100 traditions. They are Kharijites. I hope you have heard the name Kharijite and maybe some of them, some of you, they haven't heard. Kharijites were the people, the first group of terrorists 
in the history of Islam who took up the arms. They were in the la they were with the last orthodox caliph of Islam, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When a situation arrived that he he decided for dialogue, conversation, and a peaceful settlement of dispute through dialogue. This is very significant, which shows light on the mentality of terrorism. When he decided that we will decide the matter peacefully, peaceful, we want peaceful settlement of the dispute, and we want by an arbitration, and we want through the dialogue. When they heard of dialogue, peaceful settlement of dispute, and arbitration, they came out of the army, and they were the first person who took arms against Sayyidina Ali, the fourth Islamic Orthodox Caliph. And they said, we don't accept dialogue. I'm giving you a historical picture so that you may apply it on the present day terrorists. We don't accept peaceful settlement. We don't accept settlement through dialogue. We accept settlement through sword. So some people think that Islam has been emphasizing the sword. It would be absolutely wrong. Al-Qaeda. I won't say this is a new world in the old evil. I will say this is a tactically, ad tactically adopted the same world. Imam, I have quoted a full chapter on this subject. Imam Ibn Hajar Asqalani and Digar Aima and authorities have noted various groups of Khawarij, Kharijites. Imam Asqalani in Fatul Bari and other Aima, they say there was a group of Kharijites known as Al-Qadiyya. The same word, Al-Qadiyya. And Al-Qadiyya means the think tank of the terrorists. Sitting, Al-Qadiyya, sitting behind, not actively participating in the terroristic acts, but providing them support, appreciating them, providing them mental, moral, religious support, and appreciating their activities, but not practically involving in the terroristic activity, though whose are the well-wishers and who are supporters and provide them, buck up them, they were known to be Al-Qadiyya. Our every book of Islamic history possesses this name. So what is the difference between Al-Qadiyya and Al-Qaeda? Just the letter Alif has been added. Those Muslims who say that voting is wrong, it's haram, forbidden or shirka, uh, associating others with God, uh, tend to be the most ill-informed and ill-educated Muslims in our community. The majority of scholars, Shia and Sunni, traditionalist and modernist, uh, agree that voting is not haram. In some cases they say it's your obligation. They also tend to be pessimistic and cynical. One of their arguments is, is that even if Muslims did get involved in the political system, they're not going to bring about a lot of change well, in terms of foreign policy. Well, of course, that's taken for granted. It's taken for granted that if anybody anywhere, this is not a Muslim issue, anyone anywhere, whether you're a green activist who wants to get involved to make politics more uh, greener, whether you're a Muslim who wants to get involved to try and better represent your community and make sure Islamophobia is not the dominant trend in our national life, you're not going to change things overnight. But the idea that you simply disengage from the political system, I think is dangerous, it's pernicious, it's irresponsible, it's immature. Those Muslims, for example, who say, don't vote, don't get involved, it's all wrong, it's all pointless. That's fine. What are they doing instead? What, what impact are they having on British society? Whether it's the, uh, the nutters of Al Mahajroon and co, or the slightly less nutty but equally fringe groups like Hizbut Tahrir, who believe that we should disengage and we should stay out of politics. I believe they are disempowering Muslims in this country. They are making us uh, a target. They're making it easy for us to be sidelined, marginalized, dispossessed. And if we are British Muslims and we want to take part, then we have to vote. And I'll give you one quote uh, from uh, a man named Bal Thakurai, who is the leader of the right-wing Shiv Sena party in India. He said, the first thing I would do if I was in charge of the government in India is I would deny the Muslims the right to vote. Deny them the right to vote. The enemies of British Muslims, those people who don't want British Muslims to do well, are those who want us not to be voting and sticking in our ghettos where we can be marginalized. Let's take our next call. I just want to ask the <clears throat> Sheikh, yes. is he a Jewish Sheikh, yes or no? <clears throat> that was an easy question.
the martyrdom they seek. Muslim organizations in Mumbai have decided that Muslim cemeteries will not open doors for the last rites of these urban jihadis. But this way, thousands of people have been killed in this country. In this country, there are 25 crore Muslims in this country, who have been killed in this country, who have been killed in this country, who have been killed in this Sufaha ul ahlam. They will be brainwashed. It's amazingly, when Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, is telling all these, disclosing these realities 14 centuries before. They would be deployed and then they will be brainwashed. What is the brainwashing? That if you are losing your life, you are getting shahada. And by suicide bombing, you are doing jihad. You are going direct to Jannah, to paradise. This is how they are being brainwashed. And they don't have the knowledge of Quran and Sunnah. This word brainwashed, Sufaha ul Ahlam, comes in Sahih Bukhari. And I quote Hadith number is 6531. Again in Sahih Muslim, Hadith number is 1066. Ahmad bin Hanbal, Hadith number is 616. And hadith number 912, 1086. An-Nasai, number is 4102. And many other books of hadith. My dear and respected audience and the journalists and the leaders of the community, I would say a wrong image has been presented about Islam in the Western world. The reason is that media is always interested in news. And peaceful people never create news. Throughout the history, media is always looking for news and a terrorist creates news which peaceful person cannot do. So that's why they were always being propagated and promoted. And the picture which Western world got about Islam and Islamic Ummah and community, that was because of the terrorist people and the shout people shouting uh, uh, here on the roads and saying we will hit America and we will hit Britain and we will do this and that, the silly people. So these, these were the news which have been always promoted and they are very few people but they are armed. Single armed person is powerful than 100 unarmed persons. They are not even 1% of the ummah. But unfortunately they have, they have the power of nuisance. Holy Prophet said, Fazakar al-Fitan. He, Holy Prophet, mentioned disruptions. And he said, Faqsara fi zikriha hatta zakara fitnat al-ahlas. فقال قائل يا رسول الله وما فتنة الأهلاس قال هي هرب وحرب This is hadith of Sunan Abi Dawood Hadith number is 4242 Umar reports Abdullah bin Umar We were once sitting with the Prophet وسلم, When he described disruptions And when he described disruptions At length he mentioned the disruption of Ahlas a specific term he used, disruption, fitna of ahlas. So people asked, Ya Rasulullah, what, what would be the fitna of ahlas in later centuries and later times of your ummah, in this mankind? What would be the fitna of ahlas? He said, it is a chaos, it would be anarchy, it would be violence, it would be militancy, it would be killing and killing and terrorism. Authentic text of the hadith of Holy Prophet which were delivered 15 centuries before our time referring to the present time in which we are living now he said qalu ya rasulallah ayyuma huwa qala al qatlu al qatl this hadith has been debated related by Abu Huraira a famous companion and reported by Imam Bukhari in Muslim and Sahih Muslim muttafaqaleh Holy Prophet said the time would draw nearer and then said that on the surface of earth, disruptions, mischief will rise and haraj will arise and it will appear in abundance. People submitted to Holy Prophet or Messenger of Allah. What is haraj? This was a specific term. Holy Prophet said, keep in your mind that time the haraj would be killing and killing and mass killing of the people. And the people committing this act, the killings and killings and mass killings of the people, they will go outside from the ambit of my deen. This was a clear-cut 
reference in categorical reference to the act of terrorism. There is something uh, in the list of, of punishable crimes in Islamic uh, law books called Bari and another thing called Hiraba. These are the two categories that are used. And Bari normally categorized as a religiously based rebellion against lawful authority. Uh, there's no punishment fixed for it. It's up to the judge. But uh, generally, if such people repented and clearly were sincere in their repentance and laid down their arms, then uh, an amnesty could be uh, applied, particularly if, even though they've been advocating what we might call terrorism, but don't actually do it, and then it becomes clear that they have renounced that opinion, and then uh, they are generally subject to an amnesty. And Hiraba um, is a more fearsome category. It's a severe form of insurrection that is not just a potential or actual military challenge to a ruler's army, but involves attacks on civilians. So things like brigandage, rape, the wanton destruction of property, and the murder of civilians. So Ibn Abdul Bar, who's one of the great medieval Muslim jurists, he was chief ju judge of, of Lisbon, dies in 1071. Anyone who disturbs free passage in the streets and renders them unsafe to travel, striving to spread corruption in the land by taking money, killing people, or violating what God has made it unlawful to violate, is guilty of hiraba, whether he be a Muslim or non-Muslim, free or slave, and whether he actually realizes his goal or not. And the distinction between hiraba and just common or garden uh, murder or um, uh, brigandage is the intention to cause a sense of fear and helplessness. That's what uh, Heraba uh, uh, represents. The underlying root of the word Heraba in Arabic has the sense of, of rage and fury, which is identified as a pagan quality. The rage of the religious radical who has broken the bounds by attacking civilians. That's the essence of the medieval understanding of what Heraba is. So you can understand why modern Sharia theorists immediately say all of these Al-Qaeda type movements are in this category. They tick all of the boxes. Um, so for instance, one jurist says, these extremists rely on worship themselves. They're exhibiting the most serious crime condemned in the Quran, which is the root of almost all other crimes, namely arrogance. They're committing the crime of Hiraba, which is the attack on the very roots of civilization and justifying it in the name of Islam there can be no greater evil and no greater sin. That's part of a, a fatwa against Al-Qaeda. Incidentally, Hiraba is the most severely punished crime in Islamic law. Anybody mm -hmm. uh, can go out and, and, and uh, take a gun, and, and take the life of, of, of somebody else with, with absolutely... People have to realize a, a human life, the preciousness of one human life, whether they're... It doesn't matter what religion they are. Mm -hmm. The preciousness of human life. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. Takreem. This is... Allah has dignified the children of Adam. And this is all of the children. So, takreem, al uh, adamiyah of, of being Adamic, of being mm -hmm. a human being, precedes the takreem, the, the dignification through uh, tawheed. Mm -hmm. I mean, every human being. It takes nine months of, of a mother vomiting, getting up in the night, distress. Wahnan mm -hmm. ara the Quran says, sapped and weaned of her strength mm -hmm. to, to produce this extraordinary miracle of God, which mm -hmm. is a human life. And then two years of rada'ah, of, of, and then almost uh, 12 years before the intellect is, is, is really fully mm -hmm. formed where it can choose between good and evil. Too much investment goes in mm -hmm. to a human life to simply annihilate that life uh, with, with, with impunity and utter uh, uh, lack of concern mm -hmm. uh, for, for what that preciousness is. And our prophet was not a warmonger. He did not like war. He disdained war. He said, never hope to meet your enemies. But if you're forced to meet them, be brave in the battlefield. He prohibited the killing of civilians. He prohibited the killing of women and children. In the Maliki fiqh that I studied, the Maliki jurists were so troubled by the hadith that they said, if you see a woman on the battlefield, run away from her.
Al-Qaeda led by Sheikh Osama bin Laden that become the leaders of the Muslim Ummah. Fifteen minutes ago, bodies started dropping from the top floors of the uh, tower closest to the highway. About at least five or six, and uh, it was it was absolutely terrible. Obviously, they had two choices: to be burned into in flames or to uh, leap and end it all. innocent people we mean Muslims. As far as uh, non-Muslims are concerned, they have, uh, they have not accepted Islam. As far as we are concerned, that is the prime against God. There are many things in the Prophet of Allah when they were killed in the Prophet, they said, I gave them to them. They said, I gave them to them, and I gave them to them, and I gave them to them. The Muslims, we drink the blood of the enemy, we can face them anywhere. That is Islam. Wallahi, laqad chittakum bitab. He said, I come to slaughter all of you. He said, another yuk akbal. He said, I laugh when I kill. Kardeşim savaş bir kere e, bir ülkeyi felç eder. Yani Allah vermesin. Savaşı öyle çok kolay. E, e, filmlerde gördük. Kapışalım, savaşalım. Ondan sonra indirelim aşağı. Onlar bize, biz onlara. Öyle bir şey olmaz. Savaş olduğunda perişan olur. Ama savaş kışkırtıcılığı yapmak, savaş kışkırtıcılığı yapanlar e, bu tavırdan vazgeçmeliler. Bu çirkin bir harekettir. İşte Yahudilerle savaşalım, Hristiyanlarla savaşalım. Böyle kabalarlık yapan az önce dediğim gibi oluyor. Dediler ki gelsin Amerika, pestillerini çıkarırız dediler, dar makyajan ederiz falan dediler. Sokaklarda ellerini sopayla Amerikalı arıyorlardı. Amerika geldi, pır, adamlar kayboldu, araziye geçtiler. Bak görüyorsunuz kayboldu, ordu, ordu kayboldu. Bir tane asker kalmadı ortada. Şimdi de Amerikalı askerlere kadın satıyorlar, malboru satıyorlar, esrar satıyorlar. O savaş kışkırtıcıları yapanlar. Sakallarını tıraş etmişler. Ama sahtekarlık yaparlar. Onun için böyle üç kağıtçılara hiç kimse film vermez. Ucuz kahramanlıklarına kimse kanmaz. Anytime any group, whether it's good or evil, wants to get people's attention and mobilize them, they are going to use language that resonates with their audience. Um, so in, in responding to the idea of, of terrorist groups using religious symbolism, of course they do. 
they would be they would be stupid not to because guess what they understand their audience but do we if you really analyze Osama bin Laden's rhetoric as I have what you find is his religious language is quite superficial that he starts out his statements praising God he ends them by praising the prophet and in the middle you have essentially a very um postmodern political revolutionary ideology whereby he uh gets around the prohibition on attacks on civilians somebody called me up on a recent arabic program and said what do you think of sheikh osama bin laden and i just said first of all what do you want from the question do you want me to be if i answer oh he's a great guy to be in guantanamo bay tomorrow i mean is that kind of the idea or what you want not you know i think he's terrible uh but who made him a sheikh really who made sheikh osama bin laden a sheikh osama bin laden is an accountant ayman zawahiri was a pediatric surgeon and these people are giving fatwa from caves in afghanistan telling people to kill Muhammad al-Zawahiri, Sheikh al-Azhar at the time, the grandfather of Ayman al-Zawahiri, the companion of Osama bin Laden. In 1924, after they couldn't elect a caliph in Mecca, he said, let's do the janaza, which is the funeral prayer of the Muslims, over the nation of Islam. So what happened between Muhammad al-Zawahiri and Ayman al-Zawahiri? I mean, how did that chasm occur? suicide bombings blowing up the people with your with your suicide bombs blowing up the people and burning them again this ayah of holy quran comes in surah al buruj verse number 10 stated inna allazina fatanu al mu'minina wal mu'minat thumma lam yatubu falahum azabu jahannam walahum azabul hariq this is where the suicide bombing comes in quran to blowing up the people maybe any any form and the prevalent form today is the suicide bombing harrakuhum bin nar to blow up the people with your fire or your bombs
of course when quran says 1500 years before he won't use the word bomb bomb were not available in those days he used the general term to blow up the people and to kill them by blowing up them it is reported by abdullah ibn abbas that it is it means that to blow up the people with the, anything which which fires and burns them and abd bin humaid and ibn al munzir reports from qatada the follower of companion a great muhaddis he said harraku this is blowing up the people again hazrat qadada says and uh, imam qurtubi and abu hafs al hambali reports the same aima says because of this ideology since they consider this killing lawful so considering lawfulness of the killing of mankind this makes them kafir they take them out of the ambit of islam this is authority of the imam the greatest imam of islamic history imam ashari and abul mansur al maturi the quoting masul and then he said li anna man kafara bi ayatin this is for the arab world and my dear muslim youth man kafara bi ayatin min kitabillah yasiru kafiran bil kul since he has committed he has rejected one commandment of quran so he has rejected the whole of quran in the same way then he says that hazal hazil ayat dullu bil hukm fi ahli al kufr wa ahli al islam jamian and this is equal for the muslims and non muslims the second quranic verse comes for allazina yuharibun allah wa rasulahu wa yasauna fil ardi fasada quoting this quranic verse the scholars like imam hasan al basri imam qatada da tabi'in and mujahid and many other aima and tabi'in they have reported this that this leads to the act of kufr then holy prophet himself stated to the ummah reported by imam bukhari related by abdullah ibn abbas he said la tartaddu ba'di kuffara yadribu ba'dukum riqaba ba'din don't turn don't become non believers don't reject my deen don't become non believers don't go out of the ambit of iman because of killing one another so holy prophet this was the last sermon of holy prophet reported in sahih bukhari kitabul fitan and many other books of hadith too i'm quoting bukhari muslim that he stated yadribu ba'dhum riqaba ba'd in this human killings this act will take you to the kufr imam fakhruddin razi reports in at tafsir al kabir he says ala inna azab jahannam huwa al azab al hasil bi sabab kufrihim this azab al jahannam the hell fire this is because of their kufr because they blow up the people so they commit the act of kufr wa azab al harik huwa al azab al zaid ala azab al kufr bi sabab annahum ahraku al mu'mini and they are doing here in the western world and they are doing the same in pakistan they are doing the same maybe in other somalia and many other countries wherever they are blowing the humanity or they are blowing the muslims so this act of ihraq blowing them up and the, this is the best word used in quran for suicide bombings he said this this is an act of kufr and they will get two double punishments as compared to other people and again sahibul jalalain imam siyuti he also says the same word al ihraq a fatanu it has been translated by al ihraq now their fatwa is based on a famous fatwa from mardin the fatwa that killed Anwar Sadat is the same fatwa. My sheikh and teacher, Sheikh Abdullah bin Beya, recently held a conference in Turkey in the city of Mardin, which is where the fatwa was, was, uh, the fatwa was addressing an issue in that city. The fact that the ruler of that city was a Muslim but not applying Islamic law and he was under the influence of the Mughals who were uh, not Muslim at that time. He was asked, is this an abode of war or an abode of peace? He said, it's neither one or the other it's a hybrid because it doesn't have the qualities of the abode of war it doesn't have the qualities of the abode of peace and then he said something very interesting he said therefore the believer should be treated in accordance with the fact that he's a believer and the disbeliever should be fought yuqatiru al khariju an al shari'ati bima yastahiq the disbeliever should be fought because he's left the sharia and as he deserves to be Now Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya when that fatwa was read in Mardin he said that can't be right the text the ulama that were in the audience some of them some of the biggest ulama in the Muslim world all said Sheikh don't change the fatwa 
it's Sheikh al-Islam's fatwa. We can address the problems of the fatwa, but don't change the text of the fatwa. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayyah insisted. He said, no, something is wrong with that text. It doesn't, it doesn't work in the Arabic language like that. When he got back to Jeddah, he went to another text and found that it did not say that the one who left the Sharia should be fought. It actually said, instead of yuqatiru, it said yu'amalu. He should be treated in accordance with him being a disbeliever. In other words, there are many rules that relate to disbelievers. Then he asked for the oldest copy in the Vahriya Mektaba in Damascus, and it came back saying, in fact, that he should be treated, not killed, or fought. That fatwa was published a hundred years ago and has been replicated in countless editions of his fatwas saying that they should be fought. That is the basis of Abdul Salam Faraj's fatwa to kill Anwar Sadat. It was the basis of Bin Laden's fatwa to kill the Americans and also to overthrow the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia. It's a, it's a misprint. They've based an entire philosophy on a misprint in a text that occurred a hundred years ago. This is a crisis in our community. various strange hybridized models so you have Colonel Qaddafi with his weird vision of some sort of Leninist Islam I don't know how you categorize it certainly post post classical you have the Saudi monarchical model um, where the city of Mecca now looks like Las Vegas but without the gambling and somehow they think that's how a holy city has to be and the lifestyle of the princes you have the Iranian Republican gangster, semi-educated elite with the Republican guards beating up people in the streets and probably fiddling with elections. That doesn't really look like a sincere religious movement that's interested in serving the people. Where does it exist? They say all these democratic Western governments are kufr and the Muslim governments and is in the, of the Islamic world who are practicing democracy right or wrong. They have a democratic right to criticize. But this is not pure and honest democracy, there are corruption, there are right, you have right, but you have a full right given by Islam for peaceful discussions. Go, enter into the political process, go, do, go in the process of vote, go to the court, act through parliament, raise your voice through a peaceful democratic constitutional means. All these ways have been mentioned in hadith in the Islamic state of Medina through the constitution, which is known as Misak al Medina. He entered into a political alliance with Jews and Christians and their tribes. And he, of, he was the one who declared the charter of human rights for the mankind. He was the one who declared the guarantee for the rights of the non-Muslims and the respect for their local laws and customary laws and freedom of their religion and freedom of their culture and everything. This is what the deen which Holy Prophet Muhammad presented it to the mankind. He thinks this democracy is kufr, which is not. Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, himself laid down the foundational principles of democracy, leaving the peaceful ways away, taking up the arms and declaring democracy as kufr. It means you are rejecting the, rejecting the traditions of Holy Prophet. Holy Prophet said, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and Abu Dhar, he reports, Isnan khayru min wahidim. وَسَلَاسَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ إِسْنَيْنِ وَأَرْبَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ سَلَاسَةٌ وَخَمْسَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَرْبَةٌ وَجَدُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْجَمَاةِ Holy Prophet said, the, the opinion of two is better than opinion of one. The opinion of three is better than two. 
opinion of four is better than three, that of three. Opinion of five is better than the opinion of four. And then he said, this majority is known as jama'ah. And Allah places the hand of protection on jama'ah. This is the hadith which provides the actual basis of democracy in this world. So when you say absolutely democracy is kufr, you don't know what your, our own prophet Muhammad peace be upon him has been preaching. Islam 1400 years ago explained democracy in the best way. No compulsory religion. Prophet wasallam did not force the Zoroastrian or the Jews or the Christian to live in Medina. He gave the, the, the, the freedom for them to move unless until they uh, if they pay taxes as we pay taxes in every country today everyone was working in the system in the same system so democracy came within islam by prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he entered mecca what he did he freed everyone those who were coming against him fighting with him he freed them and don't forget that when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam left dunya passed away did he appoint a successor? He did not. The Prophet wants to show the highest level of freedom. At that time, there were a, three different groups were trying to compete to get, uh, be, to get the, the leadership. The, the Muhajirun, the, the immigrants from Mecca to Medina were one group. Ansar were one group. The supporters that they live in Medina, they were one group competing and the family of the prophets so they were a competition like like three parties so what happened they were competing and they, the finally what they dis, uh, voted all of them they agreed on Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Siddiq this is what happened this is history you cannot change history this is in, in, in Islamic history why we have to why we have to hide, hide behind our uh, uh, who can change the Muslim leadership Muslim leadership today is holding the power by gun and weapons. Sayyidina Abu Bakr did not. Sayyidina Umar did not. Al Khulafa al Rashidun did not. Muslims, through many centuries, they show the, the, the, the, the way of living together. Everyone wants to be the king of the whole Muslim world and the whole Muslim Ummah, and everyone become. This is what we are seeing. We are seeing that governments and leadership are not up to the standard of being uh, the role model of everyone, like Prophet Sallallahu For 12 years, I was the blacksmith of my ego. Then, for five years, I became the mirror of my heart. Then, for a year, I looked at what lay between the two of them. And I saw around me a hidden layer of ego. So I strove to cut it for 12 years and then looked again. Yet I saw around me an even more hidden ego layer. So I worked to cut it for five years looking to see how to cut. Then it was unveiled for me, and I looked at creation and saw that they were all dead. So I recited the funeral prayer over them. It means that after he struggled hard for over 30 years, and his ego was disciplined, his heart illumined. And he had conquered and achieved complete mastery of self. At that time, he looked at all created beings. 
and found them to be dead. That is, completely powerless. One of the things that I learned from the Muslim scholars, the genuine Muslim scholars I met in the Middle East while I was staying there, that people like Imam Abu Hanifa, Abdul Qadir Al Jilani in Baghdad had open discussions and debates with atheists. Um, and this whole, set, whole thing about having a superior mindset, I mean, in the Quran, Allah talks about, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ that we've ennobled humanity, the children of Adam. And it's really, I mean, it, it's, it's, exp it's explaining Islam in its authentic, traditional way as our forefathers understood it. And that's the best antidote to extremism. It takes time, it doesn't come about easily. Right. But once there are sort of open hearts and uh, open ears to listening, I think, we, you know, mainstream Muslims have a much, much stronger argument based on a 1400-year track record, now as opposed to this new Islamism of, of, of the last 60 years. The most important part is to actually turn to genuine, orthodox Muslim scholarship my opening came about when I met people like Imam Hamza Yusuf Hansen, people from the Arab world such as Habib Ali Al Jifri Hafizahumullah, people like that who have a genuine relationship with God. You see them in the early hours of the morning turning to God and you recognize, well, my empty, bankrupt ideology has made me an awful human being. And I look to these people who are connected to the Prophet that I claim to claim to work for and I see in them a light, I see in them a commitment to Islam, a commitment to humanity, a commitment to God. And I think it's exposure to people of that caliber who have an established tradition going right back to the Prophet that allows for extremists to recognize that somehow they were sold a pup and you know it's, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with leaving those organizations right. and coming on board the mainstream Muslim caravan. There's this concept and it's a very important one to Muslims called Ijaza. Ijaza literally means a license, a license to derive law from the principles laid out in the Quran and in the prophetic tradition. This Ijaza is obtained through study and scholarship and was always open to women and men. When we open it up to simply anyone, Anyone can interpret the faith and anyone can make law and issue fatwas. What we risk is the ishtihad of ignorance. This idea of ijaza did not mean a monopoly on the law because it was open to anyone willing to go through the work and the scholarship to obtain this license to interpret but it assured that we would not have the ishtihad of ignorance that produced Osama bin Laden. They have a hugely vast array of opinions. Religious interpretation is not binding, and this is really important to understand. It is not simply, it's, it's, very, it's very different um, from, say, uh, an edict by a religious authority because it is a, an opinion that you can either accept or reject and you can choose someone else. It, it's really much more like a medical opinion. So you go to a doctor and they give you their diagnosis. You can go get a second opinion and a third opinion. Now you shouldn't be able to write your own prescription without going to medical school, but you should be literate enough in medicine to ask the right questions of your doctor. classical ethical treatises, they are philosophical treatises that teach people how to reason ethically. Not simply having a hadith that tells you some ethical truism, but to reason ethically, because if we had people reasoning ethically, we would never have come up with fatwas that supported suicide bombing. One should follow people who are properly, traditionally accredited, who have ijazah, who are authorized to teach by people who are themselves authorized. Um, in a chain that stretches back to the authors of the original texts. And you can still find people like that. Generally, those people don't have much to do with the regimes, and don't have much to do with the various radical movements either. Their perception is that the problems of the Muslim world are too profound um, for there to be a merely political resolution. There has to be a transformation of, of souls, which can only come about with quiet, grassroots religious transformation away from the, the limelight. That's what I've always found to be the case. <coughs> you go to any Muslim city and there is the official religious hierarchy and they've 
done their deal, and inshallah they're sincere. <coughs> There's also large numbers of scholars who have nothing to do with officialdom, have nothing to do with the radicals, but are just keeping the tradition alive, and they'll give you fatwas and responses if you ask them, but you have to work quite hard to find them. We have to recall that Islam, again, doesn't have a central source of authority. You can't find a single voice who speaks for Islam. The religion is enormously diverse. It's disorganized religion, if you like. It's not organized religion. In many ways, I think that's a healthy thing because there's a big polemic, a huge argument, fundamentalists, liberals, modernists, feminists, everybody, having a go at each other. Eventually, some kind of consensus will emerge. We're almost going through a reformation-type stage at the moment with the Enlightenment added simultaneously. And that's not going to be an easy argument, and it's not always going to be a peaceful argument. Look at Europe's history. The European Reformation was perhaps the most violent episode in its history. And with the spread of Saudi-type fundamentalist religion with the petrodollars, which is a major part of this problem, which hasn't been mentioned yet and deserves to be, there's a certain puritanism and a desire for a literal interpretation of scripture that is really derailing the process which had been ongoing since the 19th century and the beginning of Ottoman reforms towards a more open and intelligent religious engagement. Most people watch television, they think Arabs and Jews will never live together in peace and harmony. But we want to change that opinion. We want them to know that as there is people willing to live together in peace and harmony and work together as a family, as the children of Abraham. God says in his holy book, killing one person is like killing the whole world, saving one person like you saving the whole world. Uh, that teach us that God wants people to live together in peace and harmony. God doesn't want people to kill in his name and on his behalf. Because this is really the unsolvable riddle of the planet Earth is Israel-Palestine conflict. So how can we get to the deeper level of unity and connection and understanding between the people on both sides, in both communities? Hu, hu, shalom, salam, hu, hu. Shalom, salam, hu, hu. Shalom, salam, hu, hu. Shalom, salam, hu, hu. Shalom, salam, hu, hu. Shalom, salam, hu, hu. Shalom, salam, hu, hu. Before we say there is a, a, cl a clash of civilization bet between Islam and the West, or Muslims and the West, there is already clash of civilization between the Muslims themselves. Fix that first. We are speaking about the dirtiness of, uh, uh, we are not seeing the dirtiness of ourselves, what we are. Let us fix our problems, clashes. We are, not, are we not clashing with each other? You are, we are clashing with everyone, within the Muslim Ummah itself. There is clashes. If we don't fix the, this one, how we are going to, to say, oh, Muslims are clashing with the West? It's not the Muslim. It's the minority that want to take an advantage, to take a political stand, because they rebel against their own governments, and they are motivating this, the, the, the, the, the, the, the streets and the citizens by increasing hate toward the, uh, uh, the toward the west increasing the hate in the heart of muslims to demonstrate and criticize the west forgetting that are jeopardizing the life of millions and millions of muslims living in europe and in america and that's what we have to ask ourselves as a community have we been honoring our prophet in other words have we done anything in our behavior in these lands that has led to people having a bad opinion of who our Prophet ﷺ is. Because we're ambassadors of the Messenger of Allah. We are His ambassadors. And people are going to judge Him based on our actions. And you cannot honor your Prophet by dishonoring His Sunnah. You cannot honor your Prophet by dishonoring His Sunnah. If you want to honor the Prophet ﷺ, really, if you want to honor Him, then practice His character. Practice his moral probity. Practice his excellence and his virtue towards people. Practice his forgiveness. Practice his ability to smile despite all of the incredible difficulties.
Prophet وسلم, he, he said, you know, that Islam began as an alien thing and it will return to being an alien thing. So blessed are the alienated ones. And the world is an alienating place and, and we're all going to be dead in this room uh, within at least, you know, the maximum a hundred years and there'll be a whole new group of people struggling out there. So God bless you.